Hey folks, welcome to High Five Chats, uh, number 11. Uh, I am Alan Jones with High Five Buys, and uh, I am uh, pleased to introduce y'all and welcome Michael Fremer, who is editor of Analog Planet and uh, Stereophile Senior Contributing Editor. Hey there, Mike. Hi there. <laughs> How you doing? I'm doing, I'm doing, under the circumstances that we can talk about, I'm doing okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> All right. So I want to ask everybody out there, if you'll like and subscribe, uh, shall we say you'll see your places on there to do that, and that helps you kind of uh, stay in touch with us. Also, if you want to go to hifibuys.com, uh, you can sign up for our newsletter there, which gets you in touch uh, very much with what we have going on. Uh, we have quite a few things going on. We have a new e-commerce site that'll be up uh, and live with uh, definitely within a couple of weeks. Um, we've had a little delay here or there, but that actually was ex expected. Uh, last week we had, uh, and all of the previous uh, Hi-Fi chats are actually on Hi-Fi Buys on YouTube. And uh, last week we had Dave Gordon with Audio Research, and uh, next week we have Roger Lowe with Sonos, and they've got a new product that's just introduced called Arc, uh, actually, and a few other things, and we're going to talk about that as well. Uh, not today, but next week. <laughs> also, I want to give a big thank you to the first responders out there dealing with all the uh, kind of crazy world right, it is right now, and uh, for all the work they've done as we've kind of gone through this pandemic, uh, and I shouldn't say gone through it. Uh, it seems like we're starting to open up. We definitely are in Atlanta, and uh, we seem to be holding our own pretty well so far. So uh, anyway, I'm very excited about that. So um, Michael, uh, you you a little more calm now? No, I'm I'm normal. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, listen, you've been in my store. Uh, we've known each other a while. Um, I was even looking at some pictures the other day when you were in the store, and it was just kind of. Uh, there were an awful lot of people there uh, to see you. And I know you were actually planning on coming to Atlanta, I think during the first part of this year. And I was, got I plane tickets, I was all set to come. And then, you know, I, just before they stopped, the whole thing went crazy. I said, you know, I don't think it's a good idea for me to be traveling right now. And, uh, and then it hit the fan after that. So yeah, it was, it was amazing how fast the world changed at that point. I mean, it was daily. Yep. Um, absolutely amazing. We've had to do an awful lot of adapting here ourselves, um, and I know you have as well, and we'll talk about that as we get down the road. All right, so you ready to go? I'm ready to go. All right, so we're going to get to know a little bit about Michael, and then we're going to get into some music and that kind of thing. Obviously, he doesn't even like albums. Uh, right. Very not much an analog guy, so... Uh, <laughs> so uh, anyway, tell us a little bit about your family and where you grew up. So I grew up in Queens, New York. And uh, I have two older sisters and uh, my father at one point in his life wanted to be a singer, but he never really succeeded. He had, he had ideas that never, never went to fruition. And um, I had a normal kind of uh, suburban, my parents both loved music. My mother loved classical music and I always had the radio on with classical music. And my father, he kind of tinkered with audio not as a hi-fi i had to push him into hi-fi he had a console thing but he he was a big louis armstrong fan and uh some other kind of trad jazz people and uh he did buy a tape recorder in 1953 wow early you know it was a or 55 so early 50s it was a it was a revere tape recorder very primitive and i played around with that and made recordings and I had the microphone, so I was taking the microphone and recording things on the Revere tape recorder. <laughs> and then uh, then he got an Ampro, not an Ampex, an Ampro. That was better. And I, I started doing school projects, uh, recording school projects and bringing them in. And I taught my fifth grade teacher how to use a tape recorder. And I, I have her, uh, when she signed my uh, graduation autograph book in the, from the fifth grade, she said, thank you for the lessons on the tape recorder. So, you know, this was kind of like built into my system at a very young age. And then uh, I, I went to a friend's house when I, when I got into high school. I never heard a really good stereo up to that point. And I went to a friend's house and uh, he had, his father had a nice stereo, he had a Sherwood receiver, yeah. and a KLH fives and a, uh, I think it was a Benjamin Miracord turntable. I can see it to this day. And my friend played a record and it was like, <laughs> it was, you gotta remember that in the fifties, there was no bass. There was no bass any place, you know? And maybe in the movies and even then there wasn't so much bass. And so until, you know, we went into the city to Radio City Music Hall to see Cinerama for the first time when there was good sound, there was no bass. So hearing bass, even in 64 was like, 
oh my god <laughs> this base and so that was a wow that, that was a wow moment for you that was it that was the that got me into it yeah wow you know it's amazing i'll always have that i had mine and uh i don't know it was 19 i think mid 80s uh, and just i don't know, blew me away i can remember all the gear and uh, the song that was played and so on. And it just kind of, I, I worked for that store two days later. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's how it is. You hear it and then yep. you, and now it's a little less so because you can get, it's very easy to get something that sounds decent Yep. Uh, for not too much money. But even yep. then, people come here and I like to bring the people in that do work on the house, you know, and I bring them downstairs. Like some guys came in and turned on our sprinkler system a couple months ago and it's a really bad idea to have a prejudice about what people would like, you know. So this guy was probably 18 or 19 years old, and uh, he had tattoos up and down his arm, and you know he was this Hispanic guy. He was, hey man, and I, brought, I said, come on in, I'll play, you know, play some music. He comes and he sits down. I said, what do you want to hear? And so you know what he wanted to hear? Frank Sinatra. Wow. That would be the last thing, and he wanted to hear Frank Sinatra because he was watching The Voice. And somebody on the voice sung a Frank Sinatra song. So I sat him down, I played him something from Frank Sinatra's Swing in Sessions. I don't know if you know that one on Capitol. Mm -hmm. Great recording. I put that on. He was like, I won't even use the language that he used because I guess you don't want me to use that kind of language. He had never heard anything like that. He says, Frank is right there. He's like standing right there. You know, that happens all the time. People who've never heard a good system. Yep. And, uh, that's always fun. That's awesome. So any other hobbies you have? Yeah, I like uh, cars. I uh, I bought a new Saab 96 in 1972, and I kept it till the year 2000. Wow. A brand new, it was $2,737. And in 1990, I, I learned how to do all the work on it myself in 1979. And then in 2000, I rebuilt the engine on it myself, which was a, a major uh, episode to do that. I really enjoyed it. I am one of three Jews outside of Tel Aviv who does his own car work. That's what I like. <laughs> when I lived in Vail, Colorado, I actually bought a Saab very cheaply. And uh, I remember going up the mountains and then back down when I was trying to get to Denver or to Red Rocks Park or whatever. Yeah. And um, I had that car a very short period of time. It kept getting vapor lock in its fuel pump because the elevation changes or something. I'm not sure what it was. But in Vail at that time, Saabs were all the cop cars. Yeah, what model? Yes, in the 80s, the, the, the black uh, turbos. Mm -hmm. Turbos were big. Yeah, you know, I, I have no idea what model mine was. It was a white piece of crap. <laughs> I've only driven Saabs since 1972. That's all, and that's what I drive now. That's awesome. That's I, awesome. I, I, I also, I'm a, I'm a good cook. I like to cook. One of my favorite things is cooking. Me too. Yeah, it's fun. It's my, it's my therapy after I'm done down here setting up turntables and writing and playing with all this stuff. I go upstairs and I make good food and I like to bake too. Awesome. I'm not much of a baker, but I like cooking. So my Instagram feed, you'll see a bit of my food. <laughs> it's a good thing. Yep, it is. All right, uh, life experiences, things that have had an impact on who you are. Oh, well, some of them I can't talk about. But the ones I can, <laughs> the ones I can talk about, I mean, when I got to college, the first thing I wanted to do was get on the radio station. So I got on the radio station and... Uh, I had a show on the AM radio station, which was basically a carrier current frequency that ran in the, in the uh, freshman dorms. Mm -hmm. That was really fun. And I, uh, at one point, I, I created a lot of trouble. I managed to get all the kids in the dorm to come out. And I, I promised if something, I forgot what it was exactly that I, if they did, that I would run across the arts quad naked, covered in shaving cream. And I was called Mad Mike Frommer. And I did it. <laughs> and and I got uh, the campus police came and it was a big to do. But they didn't throw me out of college, so that, that was an interesting. <laughs> then I got fired. I got fired for reading off the uh, Associated Press wire service ticker. You know, there was like there was a machine that would mm -hmm. spit out. Yep. I, I, I won't repeat what I what I read. It was it was what I read. It was what they sent me, and I won't repeat it because you want me to keep this on a you know. Yep. But but I read it and then cracked up because it was it was a double entendre kind of thing that that uh, they didn't intend, but what could I do but laugh? And I got fired for that, so. So tell us, how, how'd you get into this business? So, um, you know, I've, I got involved in audio right away. I mean, as soon as I told you, I saw this friend's stereo, I, I um, lobbied my father to buy, to go out and spend some money on a stereo. So 
he bought, he got a receiver, a Bogan receiver, not too good, but got me some AR2A speakers and a, it was Gerard Type A. And I, I, and I always loved music and I started buying records. I was always a record collector. And from the time I was three, I was playing records and collecting records. I mean, it really is. My first record was a 78 called uh, The Glowworm by the Mills Brothers. I don't know if you know that song. Uh, not exactly what you'd call hip music, but they no. were, anyway, so, so uh, I was a record collector. So when I uh, went to law school, I went to, I graduated Cornell. I went to uh, Boston University Law School and uh, I got a job immediately in the uh, record store, the, the best record store in Cambridge. So I could get my records inexpensively and have fun working in the record store. And one day, um, a guy came in trying to sell advertising for the radio station, the hip radio station, WBCN. It's a legendary, it's not there anymore, but it's the legendary WBCN, one of the greatest free form radio station in the country, I would say, one of the original ones. Wow. And he and uh, he he came in to sell advertising. And the guy that owned the store said, I don't have an ad agency. I, I you know, I'm not equipped to do this. I said, I will create your ads. I will make your ads. I will voice them. I will produce them. And I will hand it to the station because this station is a bunch of hippies and they don't even like advertising. It's, if they do the ads, it's gonna be, uh, you could go to a Minuteman Records in Cambridge and uh, they'll uh, they'll sell your record. Uh, you know, it would, would be a, a waste. And upstairs from Minuteman Records was a hi-fi store, by the way, but that's a whole nother story. So uh, I started making these commercials and within a couple of months, people were calling the station, requesting the commercials instead of the music because my commercials were very funny. And so that led, one thing led to another. And then I got on the air on BCN, which was like my first paid radio job was on WBCN. That's the station Howard Stern for decades dreamed of getting on and he finally did. I started there <laughs> and then I got fired from there too. I got fired, this is what I'll tell you. I got fired because it was international, the first international women's day. And my show was, I had the all night show, which was a great place for me to be to experiment and have fun. And uh, the program director said, your show comes on after a whole day of women's programming. Don't touch it. Don't touch it. Make believe it never happened. And I could, it was like, I had to touch it. You know, I touched yeah. it. They <laughs> came on the air and I said, welcome to the men's room. Men's music, Herbie Mann, Manfred Mann, the Johnny Mann singers, Mandrake Memorial. I mean, it was just the most inane. I said, he's not gonna fire me over that, but he did. Anyway, oh. so uh, fortunately, some guys heard me, heard my voices and liked my voices and hired me to, to write the animated film, Animal Olympics, which you may have seen. Mm -hmm. That's how I got to California. And, um, and then from that, you know, the voices were Gilda Radner, Billy Crystal, Harry Shearer and me. Now they've all drifted off into obscurity and I'm a big star. No, okay. So, <laughs> and then I supervised the soundtrack to Tron. And then, because that movie wasn't, so, even though it got an Academy Award for best sound, um, that was that movie didn't succeed, and so the director he his career kind of stalled. And since as a as a tech guy, I would move along with him. My career kind of stalled, mm -hmm. and I all the time I was reading the Absolute Sound every issue, and you know the Absolute Sound would show up, and uh, someone would call me on the phone and say, "How you doing, Mike?" I go, uh, "The Absolute Sound just showed up." I said, "Okay, we're not going to bother you for two days. You can read the idea." And so I'd sit there and read it. And when you get to the last page of the Absolute Sound, I was like, oh no, I, I finished it. Oh no, there's got to be more. Because back in those days, that magazine was absolutely yep. magical. You know, there was HP and Harry Pearson and uh, Room A and Room B and all these famous people. You know, you'd see, you'd see the pictures and the friendship parties. It was like this yep. world, he created this world that you just wanted to be part of. And I had no money. You know, I, I, I get really annoyed if people say, you know, this stuff is so expensive, I can't afford that, you know, blah, blah. And I say to these people, I couldn't afford it either when I started reading this. And I read it to learn. Yep. I read it to learn and I cobbled together whatever system I could afford, which wasn't much. But I learned from reading. I learned how to listen. I learned about a lot of great music. So don't be resentful of people who can afford what you can't afford. It's really yep. stupid. Anyway. From there, one day, Pearson uh, put a thing in the absolute sound. He's looking for a pop music editor. And I wanted to leave LA at that point. My girlfriend had left me and I was miserable. And there were stories I, I don't want to talk about the story. They gr I'll put them in my book, but I'm not going to tell you. So you moved? Moved back east to, to, to work for Harry, you know. And and uh, I was a pop music editor. I was living in Hackensack, New Jersey, down the block from where Rudy Van Gelder's studio was. Wow. Was amazing. 
my phone keeps dinging. You know why my phone is dinging? Because of the thing I was doing before we got on the air that I was telling you it was a total disaster. I'm sure people are absolutely mad at me. Let me tell you what that is, okay? Just so you know how difficult my job can be. So you know the electric recording company. They make these fantastic records, 300 bucks a record or 400 bucks a record. They're doing Love Forever Changes, one of the great records from the, one of my favorite records of all time. So they announced a mono uh, issue of it. And I have a mono uh, issue of it. I have a mono original right here. Wow. Of Love Forever Changes. They announced it. And the way it was worded made me think they were using the mono tape and it was a discrete mono mix. It wasn't a fold down from stereo, which was kind of unusual because by then they had stopped making discrete mono mixes. Anyway, I put the announcement up and people started buying it right away, even though it's expensive. And then I get an email from the guy who's making it saying, no, no, it's a fold down from stereo. It's not a real mono record. So uh, just- You need to go and correct it. I had to go on and quickly amend what I wrote. I feel, I really feel bad about something like that. You know, I really- Just so y'all know, we had uh, Mike's attention uh, when uh, he realized that was going on and we were trying to start Hi-Fi Chat. So he was zooming along, uh, excuse the pun uh, <laughs> at that. Yep. But uh, it sounds like he got through it and now we have a public explanation. Yeah, so now <laughs> rather than a public execution. So yes. at any rate, I started writing for Harry and you know, Harry uh, taught me I was doing pop music reviews, which I had done before, so that was no big deal. But it was great being in the, being in the absolute sounds like a dream come true to be writing for this magazine and and being published in there. But I wanted to review equipment too, so uh, I he gave me a pair of small and expensive speakers from a company called Seifert Research. Have you ever heard of them? Mm. They, they went on. It was a small two way speaker. I wrote that review for almost a year before he would publish it, and and he you know he took the time to teach me. And, and that is something I, I will always be indebted to him for doing that. And I try to do that with, uh, you know, young writers that I deal with, that I have right working for me. I, I take whatever, the, of course, I have some writing for me that are be better writers than me at this point, 14 year old who's a better writer than me, but that's a whole nother story. But, uh, and so I'll never forget that because he gave me my break. He taught me how to write a review. And, uh, and that's how I got started. And I was writing for the Absolute Sound from 1988 to 94. And then I had to quit. I, I won't go into what happened, you know, what was happening to the Absolute Sound at that point and what ha was happening with Harry and the whole thing. Uh, and I, I had made enemies with Stereophile. I was a real defender of what I did and who I worked for. I was a defender of the Absolute Sound to the point of really being stupid. One year, Stereophile used to have this big party at CES. And uh, the whole industry was invited, but I was barred at the door. This guy, Ken Nelson, barred me at the door. He would not let me in. I was like persona non grata at Stereophile. Nonetheless, I had to quit the absolute sound. The story behind that is a hilarious story that I won't tell you on the air, but- uh, Some other time, perhaps. <laughs> not for another time, it's a hilarious story. And I sent uh, John Atkinson a fax and I said, I've quit the absolute sound and I would like to write for you. Even though, And I expected him to say, take a walk. But he came back and said, uh, no, okay. Uh, how would you like to write um, record reviews? And I said, no, I want to write a, a column on vinyl records. That's what I want to do. And, and he said, well, vinyl's going away, Michael. And um, you're going to be write yourself out of a job. I said, I'll take that chance. So he let me do it. And I started writing Analog Corner. And... Uh, uh, been around me, a long time. Yes, on my 300th column will be next month. Wow. Yeah, that's a Congratulations lot. Congratulations to you. That's that's uh, yeah. quite a milestone. Yeah, it is. It's a millstone and a milestone. <laughs> and so here I am. And, you know, I never thought I'd make a career out of it. I, I never thought it would pay the rent. And, you know, very few writers that do this do it as their profession. Most of them do it on the side. It's their avocation. It's their hobby. It's a way they get equipment at, at a discount. But I've uh, turned it into a, a pretty good uh, paying job, full-time job, and, and it's really fun. It is the most fun. You could, it's work. You know, anybody's, oh, you're so lucky. You, sit and you and you listen to music all day. And, yeah, but you write. And uh, now you've got a bunch of questions you wanted to ask me, so why don't I shut up and let you uh... <laughs> oh, uh, I, I, just... you, You've never been short on words, that I know. So <laughs> it's all good. It's been all right. So I was going to ask you about your first time going wow, but we've already had that moment. Um, yep. It was when you were very young. And um, so I want you to tell us about a particular piece of music that moves you and why, and how did you find it? 
Well, can I be crassly commercial right now? Yes. Okay. So there's a Bruckner uh, direct-to-disc box set that just came out from the Berlin Philharmonic. And uh, I was never a big Bruckner fan. I didn't know that much about Bruckner, actually. I, like, I love Beethoven. I had a I took a music appreciation course in college, which was all Beethoven. You, you got the Ninth Symphonies with Von Karajan conducting. It's a very famous box set. That's how I learned about Beethoven. And I like Beethoven. I like Mahler. I, I tried listening to Bruckner and just, it was just, I couldn't, I didn't think, I couldn't figure it out. It just wasn't for me. So the Berlin Philharmonic last year came to me and said, we're doing a Bruckner direct to disc box set. Would you like to write some liner notes for it? And it was like, what? <laughs> me <laughs> write about classical music uh, for the Berlin Philharmonic so they sent me this Bruckner record the, the test pressing of the directed disc record you know they, they hauled the lathe into the Berlin Philharmonic concert hall and they had a very minimal mic situation tube preamps in the mics a tube vintage mixer right into the lathe it's phenomenal wow that record really moved once I got in understood what was going on it's it's available now. I suggest you buy a copy. That's what it's, it's okay. Cool. It's awesome, nice. and that I, I love the story about how you found out about it too. It was kind of a surprise to you. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, I, you know, the first concert I went to, live concert. The first two I went to was Dave Brubeck at uh, Town Hall, where they were doing uh, Take Five and Time Out. That album had just come out. Wow. So see that live at Town Hall, which was, you know, amazing. And I know, then Joan Baez at Town Hall and, uh, in 1964, and she was uh, astonishing. And that is the first time I ever saw a woman who didn't shave her legs or her armpits. And that you don't forget that. <laughs> <laughs> the audience is full of people like that. It was, right. it's, it was an unforgettable moment. So, so, so we're going to move on to mentors because we know Joan was not that. Um. <laughs> not actually, he, was, he was. Oh, he's so. Old. So who is or are your mentors in this business and in life? Well, uh, you know, Harry Pearson is yeah. the, the big mentor in, in my life. And I learned a lot from him. Uh, and, you know, the late Art Dudley, you know, what a tragedy to lose Art at such a young age. It's a sad loss. Art was a great writer. And, uh, you know, I, I consider Art a better writer than me. He never, he said the opposite, which was very flattering. But so... Uh, Whenever I would I write, even to this day, when I write and I'm having trouble, I, I, it's not coming out the way I want it to come out. I, I, there's two things I do. I read the New Yorker and I, I learn, I get back into the groove from that. And I pick up anything Art wrote. And okay. to this day, I've got a bunch of Art columns here and I go back and I read them and I read his flow and, I, and it locks me back into where I have to be. Art had a great flow with all of this stuff. I mean, I always enjoyed reading his... Uh his uh, reviews and that kind of thing on stuff. And um, it was uh, obviously when we lost him, uh, everybody around was, um, you know, just, <laughs> you could see the comments from everybody. And uh, what, again, what a very sad loss for everyone. I mean, people would say, yeah, but Art didn't like anything made after 1970. So, you know, <laughs> he did like, he did like all the vintage stuff. It, we, you know, the thing about Art and I, that was really funny is we, we have completely different tastes in what we like to listen to. In mm -hmm. what we like. But we both heard it the same way. You know, if, if you were to ask him about the piece of equipment and what it sounded like and ask me, we both heard the same thing, but we responded to it differently, which is an interesting thing. Yeah, that's, uh, you know, every, all music uh, affects us all differently. And that's one of the just, I don't know, kind of wonderful things about it is that uh, it hits everybody in a different way, but it does hit everybody. We like the same music though. You know, we both are big XTC fans and we both were uh, big fans of Procol Harum. And, and Art took his Procol Harum devo devotion to a, a shrine. He has a shrine, he had a shrine in his house, a Procol Harum shrine. I didn't have that kind of thing, but I, but we both loved that band. And his writing is full of Procol Harum and XTC and I have the same thing. And we both <laughs> loved the Elgar Cello Concerto uh, with Barbara Oli. In fact, let me pull that one out. Pardon my back. I'll pull a copy of that out if I can find it. Uh, no, I'm not gonna find it. It's annoying. So, so what we're seeing in your album collection there is that like, uh, what percentage is that of your albums? A teeny tiny. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen a picture of the room downstairs with them. That's pretty crazy. Why can't I find this record? 
it's annoying so, to me, I do, but I can't. But it's the Elgar cello concerto. Oh, well, here it is. This this record. Ah. Had multiple copies. This is an original right here. This is the original EMI. Awesome. The electric recording company reissue this, and this is what they play whenever there's like a soundtrack to a World War II footage in the UK. Mm -hmm. They play some of this. And then the bombs came and fell over London. The blitz was on, and they would play this. Some of this. Okay. It's very depressing, but it's good. It's good depressing. That's awesome. Thank you for sharing that with us. So, <laughs> my depression, I'll share it anytime. <laughs> so let me ask you, is the analog planet the digital version of Stereophile Corner? Uh, of Analog Corner? Uh, no, it's it's different, actually. So, uh, you know, I had a website called musicangle.com, which was a music review um, website that I had uh, even when I was working for Stereophile, and, and they were fine with that. It was all music. I didn't do equipment. And, uh, and I also had a magazine called The Tracking Angle. Have you ever seen that? Uh, I may have, but I don't, I, I apologize for not remembering it. Can I, can I get up and get, and get a copy? Sure. Could, you can do a song and dance while I do that. I'll, I'll, do I'll tell you what, I'll do a little housekeeping while we're at this. Uh, guys, if you will, please like and subscribe. Uh, you'll see there on your screen where to do it. Um, also, if you don't mind going to highfarebuys.com, we have a newsletter there you can sign up for. It's very easy to do. And uh, it'll keep you abreast of what we're doing all the time. We always have a lot of stuff going on. Um, during this a little bit tough time to have events at the store, we uh, wanted to have some events, so we decided to do them on Zoom. So we're big Zoomers these days. Um, last week, we had Dave Gordon here uh, on Hi-Fi Chats, and that's up on uh, YouTube, uh, Hi-Fi Buys channel. And next week, we have Roger Lowe from Sonos. And again, just want to give a big thank you to the first responders out there that have uh, been taking care of us during this crazy time in this world. So um, anyway, we got Michael back. What do you got to show us? So this was, this was uh, the magazine that I published in the 90s. Yes, I have seen that. It was really good, really I'm very proud of this magazine. We had uh, we have good interviews in here. We had good record reviews. We had uh, Jim Marshall, the photographer, was, was a fan of ours, and he let us use his covers, his art, you know, his photos, for, like that one, for nothing. He just lent them to us. So wow. Eddie Kramer, I interviewed Roy Hall, I interviewed George Martin, lots of good stuff. I couldn't get, and it was a, it was a magazine dedicated to, to physical media, buying records. It covered CDs and essay CDs. It was buy physical media. I couldn't get the record industry interested in advertising in it. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, we had 14,000 subscribers, which wasn't too bad. So I had Music Angle and then uh, Stereophile. I put pressure on them because I needed to make more money. I, was, I wasn't on a contract. I was being paid per piece. And after, you know, 15 years of it, it was like, I, I got to make more money. So I'm going to uh, work for other people. And they didn't like that. So they made an offer to me and they, they bought my website, Music Angle, and built me Analog Planet. And it's basically, you know, mostly music, news, because it's, it's, you know, it's fast paced. And I try to review less expensive gear on there. I don't, I don't review thirty and $40,000 turntables on there. It just doesn't go over too well on the internet. It's better for the magazine. Yep. So... You know, like I just I just did a Technics, uh, the new anniversary Technics turntable, and I've done some inexpensive VPIs in there. And that's really what the that's the wheelhouse of that site as far as equipment goes, inexpensive phono preamps. And I get tagged as being, oh, you only view expensive gear and you're a snob and all this other. Blah, blah, blah. I got in a fight yesterday with somebody, a really nasty fight on uh, Facebook analog, so, a Facebook hi-fi, one of these North American hi-fi. I, I mean, it's on the a hatred and anger. It was pretty, pretty easy to do today. I, I've taken the slant and I've always believed this. That, hey, listen, I, I can remember my first stereo and I loved it as much as the stereo I have today. So I don't care what you spin on it. It does not matter. As long as you love your music on it, that's all that matters. So somebody had put up somebody had put up a picture. I don't know whether you carry this. Can I mention a brand? Is it okay? If you like, yeah. So uh, somebody put up a picture and said, "This is my speaker cables, Audio Quest Dragon. It's a twenty thousand dollar pair of speaker cables. It happens to be what, what I use." And someone said, started saying words I'm not going to use about what that is and and who, what kind of people make that kind of stuff, and put up a picture of some Amazon Basic lamp cord as speaker cable. And I said, you know what? It'll make the music, but it's going to sound like blankety blank. It's not really meant for that job. 
And so they started attacking me. I mean, personally, just screaming, yelling at me, calling me names. And, and then someone said, uh, okay, well, so what is it about that cable that's not, that's not good? Uh, is it the capacitance, the resistance, the inductance, exactly what it is? And he was trying to make sure that I knew what those terms meant or, or didn't mean. So I said, well, you know what? Uh, I know what those terms mean, but I guarantee you the person that made that lamp cord and decided to make it speaker cable didn't measure any of those things or use any of those things in the production of this lamp cord as speaker cable. Yep. And, you know, and then what came back was more hatred. You don't know what those terms mean. You're throwing around terms. You don't know what they mean. And you didn't measure it. And you, I said, I never right. measured it. I simply said that it's, I said, and, and you know what? That cable is a piece, is an antenna. Yep. It's just a long, With what do you no think? No noise, dissipation, it? nothing in it. So yeah, I, it. first of all, I'm a big audio quest fan. We carry those same cables here in the store in our biggest system. And um, I also carry the stuff on down. It's about a buck a foot and that kind of stuff as well. So, you know, there is a difference in the wire. Um, I think we've all seen, uh, if you're in this hobby, we've all seen some of the nastiness that goes around. And quite honestly, it, you know, <laughs> I don't care what you're in, whether it's cars or booze or whatever, you're going to have uh, those conversations out there. It's just kind of what the social media thing is these days. So I'd let do the biggest disservice, Alan, are the people that say it doesn't matter. I, I have I, heard systems, ru I've heard a million dollar system ruined yep. with the wrong cable. And I didn't even know what cable was in the system. I just went, I know the guy and I went down and, and it's like, whoa, what's going on? And, and, yeah. Michael, the only thing that I the only thing that I will comment on that, I know that there's a lot of things that I did not believe till someone taught me in a proper way what that was and why. And um, and I know that I've had uh, lots of people that have been in my store that uh, did not have beliefs in things that now do. And um, it's not because I'm some fancy guy or anything along that lines. I've just been doing it a long time and have a I think a pretty proper way of getting those things across to people. And I think, you know, sonically, if you can hear it, great. If you can't, that's fine. Exactly. But you know, so, what? it's confirmational bias, Alan. Do you feel that you don't do a double blind test? And you know what I tell those people? I said, you know, it's a miracle that we survived as a, as a race because <laughs> it's, a, it's a tiger. I think it's right over. Oh, no, it may not be there. It may be over there. You got to stop and do a double blind test to see if the tiger's over there or it's over there. Uh, you, your ears. You, have to, you have to know how to use your ears. Yep. You know? Yep. You, have to, you have to explain to people, well, if I switch between these two speakers like this, you're going to go for the brighter one because that's what your ear is programmed to. You have to help people. Or, or, the, or the more efficient one. Exactly. You have to teach, yes. you have to teach them some basics. So we're, we're going to stay on a positive note here. <laughs> All right. Um, so anyway, I want to ask you, how many products do you review at one time? Well, you can really only hopefully review one product at a time. But I know you've got two or three in your shop or whatever, I would imagine at times. Yeah, it's an issue. It's an issue because, uh, you know, since I'm reviewing for my website as well as for Stereophile. So if I have a piece of equipment on a stand in my utility room that I'm reviewing, an expensive piece that I'm reviewing for, <coughs> for uh, Analog Planet, uh, and I'm playing it through my big system, which I have to because that's the only system I have, and there's a new piece of equipment in there, uh, it's kind of difficult. But it, yep. it's... It's doable. I just have to be careful about how I'm doing it. Yeah, uh, I have a lot of equipment here, and I put it in one piece at a time. And I don't collect equipment. I, I know there are some reviews that have walls of amplifiers that they didn't pay for, and walls of uh, things. I, everything I have in my system, almost everything I own. Uh, I own all the gear. Some of the cable I don't own. I, I I can't afford to have three looms of expensive cable. I own one that I bought. Well, I remember you. I remember you having to own up in an article about buying your Audio Quest power cables. <laughs> you read that article, yes. And that was the that those cables. You know, I was at, at the EISA convention in in Europe a couple, two years ago, and uh, um, um, Andrew Jones was there with some of his powered speakers, and he was is a four thousand dollar powered uh, loudspeaker, and he was using an eight thousand dollar. Audio Quest Dragon cable in there. And I busted him. I busted him in front of the whole audience. But he had it because it, it, I will say this to everybody watching. I think that AC cables 
next to speaker cables make the biggest difference. And I know people say, oh, sure, it comes all the way from the power plant into your house. And that last three feet makes it, well, you then don't put a filter on the end of your, uh, your, your, your faucet because the water came all the way from the reservoir and uh, whatever. Right. I got you. Well, I will tell you, we sell a, a ton of the AudioQuest power cables here. They're one of the largest uh, improvements. And I'm sure you've probably got a Niagara, I would imagine, in your system. Um, right. If not, you should try one. <laughs> really, just if you don't believe it, just try it. And yep. it, I put, the way I put them in, you read the article about what happened. Yep. I had to buy them and they were very expensive. Well, I tell, yes, I, I bought a few for myself and I bought a whole bunch of them for here and we've sold quite a few of them as well. And, you know, we, we kind of do the puppy clothes on them, which is take them home. And if you don't hear a difference, don't buy it. Okay. And, uh, and we do that from kind of entry level power cord on up because it's, you know, people look at this power cord and say, why should I do this? Well, it's not going to be my fancy words that make it. It's going to be your ears that tell you. Exactly. You yep. don't have to push this stuff on anybody. You don't yep. have to push it on anybody. It's, just, it's, like so, records, um, you know, it's like records versus CDs. Some so we have gone through kind of a real, what I'd call manufacturing kind of renaissance and what I'd call analog. So yeah. what and how do you credit for the tremendous values we see in turntables today? Well, part of it is, you know, when something becomes more popular and you can sell more of an item, you can invest more in, in, it, in designing it and manufacturing it. And you, you have the, you know, the, the, the economies of scale. Mm -hmm. And then there are people who, who they don't, they're only concerned about making something better. They, money isn't what drives them. And there are some yep. amazing, amazing products out there. You look at the cartridge market. Yeah, they're expensive cartridges. But there are some incredible inexpensive cartridges in mm -hmm. $100, $200 that are, that are really great. And what are those cartridges that you think? You know, an Orifon 2 in blue is an incredible cartridge for $200. Yep. I've got I, one right behind me. Yeah. The, 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 the red one is a good entry level, but you know, the, the, the blue, you just swap out that stylus. It's like more than twice as good. Mm -hmm. really, uh, I just reviewed a Grado. Uh, I'm just getting to review it. $275. You can listen to it digitized on my website. It sounds incredible. Is that the new gold or whatever? It's the Opus, the the uh, Opus like series. Uh, I'm bad with names. I have to go back and look at it. So much stuff comes through. You know, I, I actually re started reviewing a cartridge uh, for my column in Storyfile. I just handed it in <laughs> that I already reviewed. <laughs> <laughs> I and and uh, you know Jim Austin's the new editor, and so he uh, he sent in uh, to the manufacturer for a picture and the manuf the importer for a picture and the importer doesn't like me right now because I, I gave his book a bad review. Uh, I don't know whether you read that book review. It's, it's, it's called Hi-Fi. It's a like a vanity. Hi. Book. Yes. I gave it a really bad review. It deserved it. And I like the guy. It's going to, I will give good reviews to guys that don't like me or I don't like them if the product's good. And there are guys that are really sweet people. And if their product's not good, I will not give them a good review. I don't care. There are too mm -hmm. many people, too many reviewers are publicists. I'm not a publicist. And the okay. publicist reviewer will give everything a good review. Everything is great. Well, guess we're, what? We're going to talk a little bit about that here in a minute, about great. kind of how that works in a political way and that kind of stuff. But uh, so you did a little bit on your thing about Tommy, the record that you bought a long, long time ago. Yes. And I love the way that you talked about that because everybody thinks records are so fragile. Three copies and, and they so wear out. How, how, <laughs> how long do records last? You know what, ironically, at this point, there are records that can have been played for years and years and years that will sound better than the tape because the tape's so deteriorated. Mm -hmm. In fact, there's, a, there's a, uh, rec a fantastic record called Out of the Cool by Gil Evans, which I highly recommend. Gil Evans' Out of the Cool it was recorded in 1962 or one. And sonically, it's spectacular. If you listen to that record, you know, Gil Evans had a long association with Miles Davis. And this was before he, well, he was, no, he was working with Miles at that time, but he did this record out of the cool. And it was on impulse and the tape got burnt up in the fire. And uh, you listen to that record and you say, you know what? I hear uh, in a silent way and bitches brew on that record from 62. It took seven more years for Miles to come around to that. Mm -hmm. but it's an astonishing record and the tape got burnt in the fire. And so I have the alto analog reissue a german guy came over to america in 1997 joachim bose has passed away and he went to uh universal and licensed that title got the tape brought it to bernie grunman's cut it cut a lacquer and made this record 
it's not a big you can't get there's not many copies of it left but you can every, every once in a while find one if people don't know what it is alto analog that record digitized is better than what universal has wow you know i've always been really impressed with a lot of the impulse stuff the ojc's i guess it is that uh, we've seen those over are, time those, and yeah, ojc's are, are mostly uh, riversides and uh concord yep. catalog it's different okay yeah those are great too but yep. uh the the um records well, if you take good care of your records and your stylists, they they don't wear. You know, that Tommy, there are all these people say, oh, I hear the wear, I can hear the... I'm not saying it's perfect, but that record sounds better than a lot of the reissues of Tommy that have come out since, especially mm -hmm. back on that turntable, so. Yep, I always tell everybody, good turntable setup, take care of your, take care of your needle and uh, take care of your records. Clean your stylus and clean your needle every every play every i gotta clean it every play big deal it takes what four seconds <laughs> and then your records will i'll pull out any record i got here that's i'll pull out 50 year old records they sound incredible so i i have i have a, a question that i get asked here at the store all the time and i realize it probably de determines a little bit about the cut on the needle and that kind of thing but how many hours do needles last that's a good question uh do you know about the stylus timer? That thing that I wrote, reviewed. My, this is it. Can I, can I take one second? Go, go, sure. I'll be right back. Okay. So <laughs> he's a tough one. Um, <laughs> uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to add uh, do a little housekeeping. Just ask you to like and subscribe. And if you will, uh, go to highfivebuys.com and sign up for our newsletter. And uh, Michael's <laughs> back with uh, a new gadget for us yeah so this is <laughs> this is the stylus timer it's 1995 but if you order now we'll send you a second one absolutely free for only a small charge yeah small <laughs> it's this is 20 bucks and it's a timer designed specifically for styluses so you turn it on you push start and it starts running it doesn't register until one hour of it. it it's an hourly timer Okay. When the record's over, you push stop, and you just have to remember to turn it on each time you start a record. If you screw okay. it up, you always push reset, and uh, it's twenty bucks, and that way you know how many hours you got. So right. How long does the stylus last? If you take uh, good care of your stylus and good care of your records, you should be able to get eight hundred hours. That's a lot of time. People say eight hundred hours. That's nothing. It's a that's a lot of records. Eight hundred hours to a up to a thousand and usually what happens is the wear isn't uh, especially on a severe kind of stylus it's not it's not going to create like a jagged edge that's going to destroy your records it's kind of the opposite it's, it's it softens the severe angles on cartridges like you know geigers and replicant 100s and the severe uh, stylus profiles shibatas it's they, they soften the edges soften so you start hearing the detail disappearing and you know, and my records are sounding soft. I'm not getting the detail, and that's usually what happens. Because the general thought from manufacturers is like, seems like it's 1,500, 2,000 hours, that kind of thing. And I think that's over. That's overly optimistic. If you can get that much time and not hear a difference and not uh, see that you're not getting the, the detail out of your records, then fine. Well, it also depends on the, how critical the person is and what level their system is, and you know what level their table is, and that kind of thing as well. So 2,000 is a lot. I think that's that's pushing. Okay. All right, fair enough. I know everybody out there is probably interested in that answer, so it's great. Um, so do you have something out there that uh, helps people with setting up their turntables? Well, yes, I do. Wow, <laughs> who'd have thunk it? <laughs> uh, 21st Century Vinyl, Michael Fremer's turntable setup DVD. We actually have a couple of these at the store as well, so. You know, I, I made this in 2005, and uh, I borrowed $20,000 to make it, and I really didn't make it as a to make money because I didn't think I'd make money on it. I made it because I thought when you read the instructions on how to set up your turntable, it's you it's hard to follow. And some of these instructions you can read in three seconds, and then two hours later you're still not there. So I say I want to show it to people. And you know, on this DVD, it runs it's it's like two hours. I make mistakes, I drop things, I bang into things. I didn't cut that out. Why would I cut that out? That's what happened. That is what happened. You're exactly right. You'll see it. So that, you know, that's what I, did. so I made this and I, I put 20,000 bucks into it and I went to a, a professional, like uh, instructional DVD uh, distributor. And I said, so uh, what's the, what's the 
how many can I sell of, it, of an instructional DVD? And what's the shelf life? He goes, well, unless you're Jane Fonda doing a workout you know, tape, it, it's uh, 3,000, 4,000, maybe a couple of years. So I priced it accordingly. So it's, it's a $30 DVD in wholesale for $15. And I figured if I sell a couple of thousand, I'll make my money back and it'll last four years. Well, I've sold over 17,000 of these. Wow. And I still send every month. I sell, I send out like a hundred, 200, they still sell. And yep. now it's like a buck to press and it wholesales for 15. So you do the math. I, and people say, how do you afford your stereo? How can you afford, even at a discount, how do you as an audio writer, I know how much money you make. I've seen your bank. I mean, you, people are amazing. Is it your wife's trust fund? <laughs> it's unbelievable. Tell them yes. <laughs> so you do the math. I've, I've made like a, over 15 years, a couple of hundred thousand dollars on this DVD. That's awesome. I, I will tell you, I think you did a great job on it. And uh, there's a lot of great information in it. And, uh, you know, it's not real expensive. I mean, I tell everybody, spend the money that you did on a record to learn a little bit about what setup is in a table. It's, it's, it's easier than you think, and it's harder than you think. Okay. So it's exactly. both sides of it. Some of the information has been superseded, and I, I put the updates on my website. You know, I didn't have a digital microscope when I made this. I didn't yep. know about setting stylus rating angle with a digital microscope. I didn't know how to use a, a digital oscilloscope to set uh, azimuth. It's things that I didn't know are, are now on the website. Well, I think you're partly responsible for all these USB microscopes. Everybody's sales going up. <laughs> Maybe. Maybe. I know we bought one at that time when the uh, rake angle and stuff was being discussed an awful lot. Can I show you something else? Yeah. So this is the new Wally, Wally tractor I want to show you. So, so this okay. is the, another one of my mentors. Uh, and I should have mentioned him right away. Is, is my friend Wally Malowich. Who's a yep. You know, when you get old, a lot of your friends die. So uh, this is Wally. And Wally is, was a mechanical engineer who taught me everything about turntable setup. He absolutely did. I learned so much from Wally. He was just a great, and he just did it to be nice. You know, he didn't- That's charge. awesome. So, and he had great tools. I always tell everybody that, you know, if you're passionate about something, people will teach you because they want to help educate. I know I've been that person. I've asked billions of questions. Um, that's probably, well, an exaggeration, but I, I, I know it's way up there. I've bothered an awful lot of people, including yourself. And uh, <laughs> I've spent, spent a lot of time trying to learn, learn what I know. And, uh, you know, it's funny, the more you know, the more you need to go back and ask the same questions that you did previously. That's exactly right. And, and I, I rebuilt my car engine because I ran into a guy who was a Morris Minor fanatic and had a shop. And he said, hey, you want to rebuild your engine? I said, you know, I, I, I've never done that. I'd love to. I'll help you. I have all the equipment you need here. I'll blueprint it for you. I'll show you. You do the work. And I'll. And he did. And he put all this work on it. I rebuilt the engine in his shop. And it was great. Anyway, uh, this, is the, this is the new Wally tractor. Oh, wow. You, can't, you guys really can't see the details on there. But yeah, maybe you can. Mm -hmm. You can see a bit of it. So uh, he's got... The new one is better than the original. It now has uh, 25 or 26 arcs for arms with uh, effective lengths of 222 millimeters through 356. It covers just about everything. Okay. It's got two complete sets of arcs. One is based on the IEC standard of when records were in, from the 50s and 60s. And one of them is for people who have collections of records that were mostly new after the 1990s when a lot of records were not cut to the end anymore. Mm -hmm. Especially double 45s, if you've got a big collection right. of double 45s, you don't have to set it up for the null point to be all the way in, you can set it for it to be further out. So it's, it's a useful tool. I still set it up for the original because I have a lot of old records. And So Bearwald, Lofgren, any of that kind of stuff, do you have a particular? Yeah, I like, I like Lofgren A, that's my fave. And that's what's on here, Lofgren A. And I could show you where, where the null points are with Lofgren A and where the distortion is and where the, the peak of distortion is and where it gets really bad. You could see, and you can, if you know those, those uh, charts, you can, you can decide for yourself, you know, where, where, which uh, of those curves you want to use. They're all, they're all going to do the job to di different degrees. The Stevenson to me is the worst one, unless you listen to a lot of, you hear that I just started this, 
I didn't want to start it. Unless you listen to a lot of uh, classical music. So the Stevenson has the least amount of distortion as you get towards the end of the record, where the big orchestral crescendos are. And so you want to minimize mm -hmm. distortion there. But it's got a lot more distortion in other places where if you listen to a lot of rock and pop stuff, if you listen to rock and pop, you don't care about distortion. All your records. <laughs> you know, my head is filled with all of these things that people scream at me over the years. It's really well, no, no <laughs> screaming at you today, okay? Air screaming to me today. So listen, thanks for sharing that with us. And uh, where is that available? It's on uh, wa uh, wall. Is it wallytracker.com? Wa not Wally Tractor. Wally maybe Wally Tools. Or Wally okay. Tractor. It's on my, on my, I reviewed it on my website. You can find it. And, and All right. And we'll get a link up there. If Chris, uh, Chris is in the background, Chris, if you'll try and find a link to it up there and put it up for everybody, that'd be great. This was done, this was done by, uh, so Wally's son, Andre, uh, is a mechanical engineer too. And, and on a, t on a corporate level, he's a high, high ranking corporate guy. And uh, when Wally passed away two years ago, he, he wasn't going to get involved in this stuff. This is not his field. But another guy who was like Wally's assistant and a vinyl fanatic said, I'll, I'll make this happen. And working with Andres, they came up with this new tool. The whole story's great. You know, all these mm -hmm. stories about, you know, Matt Weisfeld and Harry and, and this and uh, the guy from AMG and all these guys getting into their dad's business. Yep. You well, know, I'm getting ready. Right. We're, we're, I, Matt and I've talked about it. So I'll, I'll have him on soon. And uh, he talks more than me. I mean, it's, I, <laughs> I I have met him. <laughs> in fact, I, we did an event at your store. Yep. That, was, that was early on in his career in this business. Yes, yes, it was. And Joe Harley was there too. Yes. And Joe and I were there. And when Matt was finished, we pulled him aside, and we we gave him a few lessons in in uh, presentation to the public. <laughs> <laughs> he was he was one step, and I'll say because he was one step short of Carnival Barker. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Right up. Oh, I want to talk to you now. Come on over here. And it was like, no. no. Well, I'll tell everybody, I'm trying to learn how to play the piano. And so I'm taking online lessons and my right hand, and my left hand won't do together. But when I talk, it does it just fine. So um, <laughs> I, I get that. All right. So you and I, at the time when everybody was at the store with you as well, there was a lot of talk about anti-skate and basically it being just way overused. Can you tell us a little bit about that and what your feelings are about it? Okay, so, you know, all of these adjustments that we make on our turntables are all compromises to a certain degree. Even, you know, what, what's your tracking force going to be? There's a range. So where do you want to set it? You know, which overhang uh, geometry do you want to use? Uh, do you want to set your, your stylus rake angle at 93? Well, it's not going to be perfect for every record because it's going to depend upon when the chuck that was used to, to set the stylus rake angle of the cutting stylus. Mm -hmm. it. There's a range there. Right. So, you know, if you want to lock your every record in and take a note and change it for every record, you can achieve much greater uh, perfection in your setup, but you'll never have time to play any records. So it's just, Or you can just have several turntables. Exactly. <laughs> or you could make a note on each record of where to set it. And there are people that do that. But yep. me, if you set a a reasonable compromise like 92 degrees for stylus rank angle is a reasonable compromise I, yep. i'm not going to why but that's really or 93. peter letterman from soundsmith says 93. he says 93 <laughs> because there's there's a dynamic stylus rake angle when you play a record it's going to change it he says by right. so there's there's you know variations so skating is caused by a variety of factors including um the fact that this record that the offset angle is it's friction in the groove to a great degree. Mm -hmm. Completely, there's going to be a whole paper on that that uh, Andre and this guy uh, J.R. Bosclair are writing, in which they claim it's not what I t say it is, and we're going to have a big discussion about that. Oh boy! The offset angle of the head shell, and there's friction in the groove, and so the friction is going on a, on a line straight behind the cantilever, but there's no pivot point there. The pivot point's offset from where the where that friction is, so it's pulling the stylus in. At any rate, if you don't apply any anti-skating, the stylus is going to ride on the inner groove the whole way in. Yep. You know, Harry Weisfeld says it doesn't matter. His position is it makes more trouble than it's worth. If you talk to Harry, he says, don't bother with it, leave it off. I don't agree with that. I think if you don't put any anti-skating on, it's going to ride the inner groove all the way, which you don't want. You have to apply some. More is worse. You're better off with less. So just a little bit some people say go to the inner groove 
and set it so the stylus just starts to go in. Do not set it on a mirror. Do not, because that's wrong. You okay. set it on a mirror, there's no friction, very little friction. There's no groove, right. so there's very little friction. You'll get the wrong setting. So it's a compromise. Less is better than more. Okay. I think that's kind of the discussion we had before. I remember you and I went to, uh, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, I've got my picture back here from the Rega factory a long, long time ago. Yes. We went to see Mr. Gandhi out there. And uh, <laughs> um, so uh, I, I think, you know, his thing is what about, I think VTA, he doesn't believe really in any VTA adjustment. So look, I understand his position. His position is that rigidity matters is the key to the whole thing. And would I rather have a, a rigid setup like his with, with no ability to adjust uh, VTA versus a, a floppy arm where you can make every adjustment under the sun? I would rather have what he's got. Yep. So let's be realistic about it. Okay. You know? uh, and those tables sound fantastic. I mean, those are phenomenal tables. Yep, they are. With no adjustment. But I if I were to have one of those, I would probably be very careful about using a severe stylus profile cartridge um or you know you can adjust it with a mat if, if you need to have a to, to, if you need to raise the arm just get a get a, a mat the mat's going to raise the arm yeah and certainly i don't like those felt mats that you know they're felt mats you know roy is a doctrinaire guy about what he believes he says don't clean your records Yes. Say that. Don't I, the stylus will push it out of the group. So I, when I stayed in this house once, I went record shopping at Bino's, which doesn't exist anymore. It was a great used record store in the UK. It was amazing. Every record was an import, and I came <laughs> back. I came back from there to his house, and I said, "Let's do it. Let's test out your theory." And uh, he had three turntables on a wall, different models, and I put one of the records on. And by the middle of the record, there was so much dust and dirt and crap and static built up. The arm literally lifted up and hung in the air like a badger. I said, Roy, please. Clean me. What you say, you know, but okay. God bless them. They make fantastic products. No doubt. Listen to them when it comes to cleaning records and cleaning styluses. It's, it's, yep. I'll tell you, uh, you know, Rega has always made, I mean, I've been selling those P3s forever and ever and ever, and it's just kind of the standard of the world that, you know, yep. it's it's really amazing. I, I love it's, that company. It's great. The, the big right. one. Um, so, fantastic turntable. In your opinion, um, and you mentioned BPI and, uh, and others, others do it as well. In your opinion, what are the strengths and weaknesses of uni pivot tone arms versus gimbaled bearings? So, the benefit of a uni pivot, I was at a, I was at a, uh, you know, every time I get asked questions like this, what ends up happening is rather than giving answers to the direct question, it, it brings up a hilarious story that involves this, which I should put into a book, I guess. So, uh, the unipivot arm, one of the big advantages of it is it's one point is the mechanical ground. It's a single point. You know, there's an arm out there that online you can see this guy's designed this arm with no, there's no pivot. There's no mechanical touching. It's like this weird hanging thing. You know, it's like no friction because the, well, where's all that energy that's, that's coming out of that groove? Where's it going? It's staying in the system. It can't get out. Right. So, the advantage of, of a unit pivot is this one ground point, all the energy coming out, all the mechanical energy that you want to evacuate the system is coming out of that one spot. That's an advantage. The disadvantage is dynamically, there can be a lot of movement in as the arm goes up and down, especially if it's the record's warped. Uh, mm -hmm. as, as even tr tracking, it's, it's gonna be twisting in the groove. That's a disadvantage. Another advantage is it's considerably less expensive to build a good unipivot, to have a well-designed point than it is to have good gimbals. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that, that's another advantage of it. Yep. Well, it's amazing the improvement in the bearings these days, how much noise we've gotten out of these things. Yes, noise. I, uh, yeah. I always tell everybody, you know, you start off with this tiny little signal and then you multiply it by 3 dB and 3 dB and 3 dB. And by the time you get to 60, 6 dB or 60 dB of gain, you're blocks down the road. And uh, it gives you an idea that everything is kind of looked at under an electron microscope. Um, by the way, anybody that has not seen the electron microscope blow up of the needle in the groove, make sure you go out and find that, search it. Chris, if you don't mind, maybe put a link to everybody, to, for everybody out there. That is just one cool thing. And it, when you look at that and you kind of go, how in the hell? <laughs> I mean, it just, I don't know, it just blows my mind. How does the symphony orchestra come out of that? Yes, <laughs> absolutely. 
and it's only playing about that much of a record. It looks like it's playing like all the way around or something, but it's only playing like that much of a record. So and the same in reverse. How, yes. How do you stuff, how do you stuff a, a symphony orchestra down two microphones if you're doing a simple record? How does that happen? And it, and it does. It works. Yep. Works yep. Awesome. Okay. So of all the ways Tonar manufacturers have implemented anti-skating devices, magnetic, hanging weight, etc., do you prefer one over the others, and why? I'm agnostic about that. Okay. I, I, you know, I know people don't like the magnetic type. They think it can interfere with uh, it, with certain aspects of playback because there's a magnet there. But I, I, I don't have a problem with that. Yeah, yeah, I think the magnet at that point is so far away that I can't imagine that it's having much effect whatsoever. And magnets are very consistent. I know we used to like it when you take the old P3, it used to be a spring loaded and it would change in time. So. Um, and then there are, there are spring types. Mm -hmm. magnets there was uh, you know some brands use spring types my arm which costs over fifty thousand dollars i know that's crazy but uh it's a string yep. it's great and he's, he's designed it with a cam and so the amount of uh, anti-skating changes as it goes across the record and you know people scream and yell about that arm but when they hear it yep. you know, if you wanted to ask me what's the most difficult part of your job it is at this point that uh, a lot of people take seriously what I write because over the years I've gotten credibility because I don't say the next product is the best I've ever heard. You know, mm -hmm. this is the best I've ever heard. The next one, this is the best I've ever heard. I don't do that. And if I don't like something, I'll say so. So this arm uh, showed up, the original version of it. And I put it, I dropped it into the slot where I usually have my, my Kuzma four point. And the first record I played, it was like, what is going on wow what and it you know after a couple of weeks uh, i was quite certain about what i heard and you know, the guy that designed that arm is a, is a mechanical engineer with graduate degrees in mechanical engineering and material science he's not just some guy with weird stupid ideas he knows what he's doing and uh i knew if i wrote this review the arm was thirty thousand dollars at that point i knew that there were people with a lot of money. And uh, I love when people say, oh, stupid people believe you. They're really stupid people. Yeah, yeah. the reason why they have all this money is because they're stupid, because they're architects and doctors, <laughs> and lawyers. And uh, you know, these people have, have accomplished a great deal in life that have, uh, has gotten them a lot of money. And that's why they're stupid. Yep. Well, again, Mike, I, I just reiterate to everybody, no matter where you are in this, as long as you love your music, that's all that matters. That's right. So, if somebody has a turntable that sells more than yours, who cares? I mean, I just, you know, I, I'm here to help you. And so is he, but I just, my thing is to everybody is just, you know, love your system, love your music. That's what it's about. And don't be resentful of people who spend more than you spend. Yep. Because and if that's the case, you will be resentful all your life, all the way around you. Exactly. Cause there's always going to be somebody with more than you. Yep. So, and, and you know, yeah. so I recently bought a Brinkman Taurus. And uh, Direct Drive is having kind of a, uh, a comeback to a degree, yeah. and, uh, and I think for good reason. And, um, and so anyway, what do you think has contributed to the return of high quality Direct Drive turntables? Uh, I think a lot of it's computer control oh, and com computer control over cogging and over how, how the motor is designed, how, how it's dealing with, with, with cogging and with being handed off from one set of coils to the next and more sophisticated designs. And there was a time when all of the measuring that was done was again for, for, for a perfection of the measurements mm -hmm. as opposed to a combination of we wanted to look good in terms of specs, mm -hmm. but we know that if there's too, many, too much control over it if, it, if the system is always hunting and pecking and trying to get it lined up correctly, it's going to sound worse. So that's what, so like the older direct drives were pretty much light platters and heavy motors. So they're constantly going at it. Right. And then today you see a lot of heavy platters with light motors. Yeah, there's a balance. And lots of different points that they're basically looking at it from. Yeah, there's a lot. And I don't, listen, you know, I don't claim to be a, a mechanical engineer and a designer. I, I just, and I, and I can't expound upon this on a technical level because that's not my job. People say, you don't even know. No, I don't. That's not my job. My job is to listen and, and say right. that. It's my job. Someone else's job is to design it. Mm -hmm. And yeah, th there have been tremendous improvements in, yes. in direct drive turntables and in the, in the motors that are used and in the motor controlling systems that are used. Yep. One thing that I would tell everyone is that if you're a, um, 
very pitch sensitive, you should look into some of the better direct drive stuff that's out there. Yeah, but even then, if the record's not not uh, pressed concentrically, you're going to really be. Yep. Then you go to CDs. It won't sound like a piano, but it'll be in tune. No. <laughs> Just I, I call that I call that a DCS streamer in transport. So <laughs> and, and a, lot people, a lot of people who are pitch sensitive prefer records. I've met them. You know, I, I met uh, this this really attractive Russian pianist named Olga Kern. I don't know if you've ever heard of her. She's a top shelf. How do you spell her last name? I think it's K-E-R-N, Olga Kern. OK. I saw her in in Denver play with the with the Boulder, Boulder Symphony, no, the Denver Symphony Orchestra. And I got to meet her backstage, and uh, and I, I always ask musicians, so so what's um, what do you like? Do you, do you like rec ever hear records? You like records or CDs? She goes, I grew up with records at home. I love records. I listen, I, I like records. That's what sounds best to me. I said, oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we got just a few more questions. Uh, I'm going to do just a little bit of house cleaning here. I wanted to uh, tell everybody that uh, we are opening up for Q&A here at the end of this. So uh, Chris, if you will, please uh, get up a little thing that people can ask their questions in. And if you will, like and subscribe to uh, Hi-Fi Buys YouTube channel there. You'll see where to do that on the screen. Also, if you don't mind going to HiFiBuys.com and signing up for our newsletter, that'll keep you informed of what's going on as we uh, do more and more uh, events and things like this as we, uh, again, open up. I can't wait to do events at the store again. Uh, last week, we had Dave Gordon with Audio Research here. What a fine man in this industry. Uh, he's been just great all, all the time that I've spent with him. Uh, Roger Lowe from Sonos will be with us next week. Uh, we call it Hi-Fi Chats with Roger Lowe. We might call that Lo-Fi Chats. I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> and uh, again, thank you for first responders out there. Uh, uh, we appreciate your efforts in this crazy time that we have right now. Yep. So. Um, Anyway, uh, and again, I love having Michael Fremer here with us. Uh, I know we've got quite a few people watching and we appreciate it very much. So uh, please ask all the questions you like. Okay. Um, when so, I first into, uh, yeah. Yes. When I first got into this business, I'd go to a hi-fi show and I would say, that's, that's Dave Gordon. <laughs> it's Dave Gordon. And now when people, it's funny how that works. I remember when I first got in this business and I met Bob Carver. I think it was CES 1988 something like that when he was making uh amps that had tube sound <laughs> it does, it does. <laughs> all right i uh, love bob all right so um i want to thank you for one for the great album reviews on uh on uh, the analog planet as they are kind of my go-to reference when people ask me and customers come in and say where do i go to find out that i'm buying a good record i think your reviews out there are honest they're real um, and that's something I've always uh, done. It's really, really tough uh, to find a place that you know you're going to get a good pressing. And so it's nice to be able to do that. Unfortunately, these great pressings go away sometimes pretty quick. And uh, so we don't always get the opportunities for it. But I really do appreciate uh, people, your... People in the, in, in the two, early 2000s, when Classic Records did the Led Zeppelin catalog, and the record was thirty dollars because I am not spending thirty dollars on a Led Zeppelin record. That is a ripoff. And I would tell people, you should buy it if you like Led Zeppelin because those are incredible signing records, and they're not going to be around forever. So yep. now, with that same record, it's three hundred dollars. <laughs> yep. Yep. But, <laughs> but there's nothing nothing more disappointing than buying a decent record or buying what you think is a decent record, taking it home, and it just doesn't have the fidelity. So. Um, Yes, go ahead. Okay, the weirdest record that I have. This is the weirdest record that I have. This oh, is, wow. Dolphy. I saw Audio Fidelity, which, you know, that's the record that they labeled it Louis Armstrong. And they were the pioneers of the stereo records. Yep. So this record is called Pop Plus Jazz Equals Swing. So if you play only the left channel, so you turn your balance, if you have a balance control, you know, yeah. all the side balance controls, turn the left channel, you get pop music. Tuned, you're driving me crazy. Uh, Autumn leaves, Indiana, Stella by Starlight, played by a string ensemble consisting of all the great New York string players, session string players, and some members of the, of the New York Philharmonic, I believe, including Harry Lukowski, whose son uh, was in the left bank and wrote the song "Walk Away, Renee." Just wow. anyway, that's on the left channel. On the right channel is jazz. Okay, jazz song. Now look, listen to who they got to play on this on, for this novelty record. Bill Evans, Wayne Shorter, Eric Dolphy, Freddie Hubbard, Curtis Fuller, Ron Carter, Charlie Person, Bill Hardman, <laughs> Paul Chambers, Jimmy Cobb, Gratchen Moncour. So it's like wow. most of Miles Davis's 
So that's who's on the right channel. Then <laughs> if you put it in the middle so you get both channels, they blend together and produce a different song. <laughs> wow. <laughs> that's pretty amazing. Isn't it? That, <laughs> I love some of the creativity that uh, has come out in record pressings lately. Uh, some of the stuff you play it backwards or you start at the inside, it'll come out and so on and so forth. And uh, dual it's grooves. dual grooves. Mm -hmm. Two different yeah. sets of things, depending on where you stick the stylus in. Yeah. I, I think I, it's just, I, listen, we all like unique stuff. And so, you know, I think it's pretty fun when you have something out there. It's kind of like colored vinyl. You know, it's uh, whether you like it or not, I don't care. I just think it's kind of fun to have colored vinyl out there. Yeah. And it's so good. Listen, it, it, each, each formulation has a different sound. So it's not black isn't the best necessarily. It's, it's different. Like to me, the best pressing of uh, the uh, Rolling Stones, Some Girls, is the orange uh, Dutch pressing, which was mastered at Sterling Sound. All the, every pressing was mastered at Sterling Sound. So they took a lacquer, they plated it, I think, in America and sent that over and it was pressed in, in Europe. And for some reason, that vinyl formulation, that Orange vinyl happens to sound really, really good. Well, I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna have to find one of those if I don't have one already. I'll have to go back and look. I know I've got two or three different copies of some girls, but uh, I I don't get quite as deep into what's pressing as most people do. Um, I'm kind of one of those. I put a record on if it feels good to me, I keep it. If it doesn't, I get rid of it. <laughs> but it can feel, feel even better. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that I'm is true. Emails every day. What's the best pressing of? What version of should I get? And I do the best I can, you know, like if you like, if you like Exile on Main Street, the Stones, the best version is an original artisan mastered pressing. It's got the artisan logo and the, on, and that is by far the best. Every reissue since has been really compressed and not very good. Sound. So if people want to ask you about a pressing or something like that, I don't want to open up a huge wide world here, but um, can they ask you on your website or email you or they do. And I answer, I, I try to answer every single question I get asked. Because that is so it's, kind. It's building your brand. You know, you got a yep. brand and, and that's how you build it. You try yep. to answer people's questions and help them. And then they always, they come back and go, I can't believe you answered me. Or that was fast. I, said, I, I do. I really do my best to do that because it's good. Well, Makes it's, me feel good. Makes me absolutely. feel good. And then they come and back. Oh, I got that pressing. Thank you. You're right. That's incredible. <laughs> that's the feedback I'm, from this. I'm is killing great. it. <laughs> is the best, part. That's the best part is the feedback and you know, getting back to that expensive arm i wrote the review and all these people went out and bought it he sold 70 arms 70 at thirty thousand dollars wow and not one person got back to me and said you know what you're an idiot that doesn't sound any better than my blankety blank everyone got back to me and said you're right that's insane it's the best thing i've ever heard so when that stops i'll quit because I'm old, I, I admit I'm old, and I and my hearing isn't what it want, used to be, and I'll admit that too. Yep, me too. I'm stupid to say, I hear as well now at 73 as I did when I was 30. No, I don't. But my listening is better than ever. I can put a piece of gear in my system and pretty quickly know what it sounds like. And then when I get the feedback from 30 year olds saying, "You're right, that's how it sounds," I know I'm good. When they all say, "You know what? You're crazy. It doesn't sound like that," then I'll I'll quit. <laughs> you know, one thing I think that uh, I get at, I get ask this all the time or actually get told this all the time by folks that are my age in North and some a little short shy of me. Um, I'm well, we'll be 59 next month, but uh, 59. I, th I think one of the things that I get asked an awful lot is basically is that, you know, I did this for a living or I did that, or I was in a band and I can't hear as well as I could. And I always tell them, I said, I'm happy to show you that you can hear as well as you used to just not in frequency. And what you'll find is that every single note is so complex that you can tell the difference in any note, regardless of whether you can hear it at 12,000 hertz, uh, 10,000 hertz, or 20,000 hertz. Sure. So you, you got to have some pretty severely damaged hearing before you really can't hear a difference in gear. My top end is good. I have uh, some you know, noise in the middle. That's my big issue. But my response on top is good. It's just it's just a little noisy. So I turn it up a little bit more. And then it's like a hearing aid. <laughs> Not too much. It's a great, great way to solve that. All right. So this is going to be a tough one for you. And let's keep it right. Um, in folklore, it is said that reviewers are given a product for a great review. Can you debut this or tell us it's true or what? I think there's some of that. Because I think there are some reviewers that will never give a bad review. Never. Uh, even to a bad product. And that's too bad. Those people should be publicists. Do, do, you, think, do you think by chance, though, that, that sometimes, you know, because 
if you give a product a bad review, you can sometimes sink a company that way, especially if they're a fragile company. And do you think it's just best for them not to do the review? I don't, you know, if, if we lived in a perfect world, we would operate the way Consumer Reports operates in the sense that we would buy the product at retail and, you know, that would be that. On the other hand, they have, Consumer Reports has its own issues. They're, they're, they're bound by the demographic of their readership. Yep. So they know how much money their readers make and all the stuff that they review is, you know, they'll tell you a Kenmore vacuum cleaner is better than a Mila. No, it's not, not even close, but it's in the price point of where their demographic is. So just because right. they don't like advertising doesn't mean that they're pristine. So I think um, I will not try to, just, I won't go into a show and see a product and say, this sucks. Let me get that so I can destroy the company. It's, that's not how I do it. I only want to review good products. I'm not interested in reviewing a bad product, but I sometimes get them, you know? <laughs> and there were some, you know, like, uh, since I'm an honest guy, Mobile Fidelity makes these two turntables. They will not give them to me to review. They won't give them to me. And, and it, it blows my mind that they won't give them to me. I know who, who's involved in the design. I'm sure it's a good turntable, but they won't give it to me. So I, I, won't re- I can't review it. Yep. You know, well, and- I, I have them both here. So if you want to take a look. <laughs> no, I've heard them in people's homes. I've heard them at shows. They're yes. They won't give them to me. Yeah, that so, their two little photo stages are pretty good too. Yeah, I don't want to give, I don't want to give people uh, bad reviews. But the last thing I want to do is take a product that's not great, or that if a product has issues, it's still a good product. I'll I'll write about it, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, but if a product isn't like I once reviewed a phono preamp this guy sent, and it was X amount of dollars for the phono preamp, but then he had a power supply for another three hundred or whatever. I opened the power supply, and it was an off-the-shelf power supply you could buy at Digikey or something for thirty-nine dollars. Mm-hmm. He was selling it for three fifty or four hundred. I busted him for that. Because, and you know what his answer was? He, he didn't get mad at me. He said, I didn't think you'd open it up. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, good job on your thorough work. All right, so this is a pretty good question, I think. Uh, what is the toughest review you ever did on a product? Wow. Um, certainly that $30,000 arm was a, the t- one of the toughest reviews because if I was wrong, uh, a lot of people would have gone out and spent that money and, and it would have been a it would have destroyed my credibility. That was a tough review. Uh, there was a, a speaker review that was tough because I, it was, a, it's a good speaker. I didn't respond to it emotionally. It didn't move me. And uh, I reviewed it and certainly talked about how, how good it was. I knew it would measure great. And I knew it, it's technologically a great speaker, but it was a speaker that it, was a neck up speaker. You know what I mean? It, it, I would sit there and go, hmm, this is, uh, this is really good. This is really, really good. That sounds good. But the lower part of my body wasn't moving. Yeah, no emotion. And that guy from that brand wanted me so badly to buy that speaker and get rid of what I own. I, I know it. You know, so that was tough. A, a tough review for me was the first uh, Grand Prix audio turntable that I reviewed, direct drive turntable. Wow. Because uh, it, it it really I didn't think it was that good. It didn't it it, it did, I thought it was a mistake in the design because it was a very light platter and uh, hall sensors you know direct drive light platter spinning around and it just didn't make sense to me and I didn't give it a good re- I didn't give it a good review and you know if I give something a bad review uh, and it's not a nasty review I don't write nasty re- I try to right. write nasty re- I knew. The next show that I walked into, I would get an earful. And I'm a, I'm, I'm a grown-up person. I can walk into a room and, and be yelled at. And he just screamed and yelled at me. You know? And then I, I got an email from somebody who is involved, who knows him, who said, I, I heard that turntable. And your review was exactly right. That's what it sounded like. You wow. got it. And I think the later ones he's done are much better. I he imagine said, it's got to be tough. And I mean, you listen to so much stuff. And you kind of, I mean, after a while, it's kind of like, I mean, I've been doing this for 35 years. I mean, I can sit down and listen to something for a minute and tell if it's a real product or not. Yeah. And then the nuances go on from there. Yeah. But the late AJ Conti, who was a great guy, you know, basis. Oh, man. Great guy. Well, I reviewed his big debut and uh, I gave it an okay review. I, I, I just thought for that kind of money, it's beautifully machined. And I just thought a big, big hunk of acrylic. I just, I don't think that's a good idea for an expensive platter. And it was just kind of kind of, 
lacking in dynamics to me. It was just kind of dead. So it sounded good. Well, he didn't talk to me for about four or five years. He wouldn't talk to me. And then finally at a show, he let me in his room. He said, we're going to talk about coffee. I know you like coffee. We'll talk about coffee. <laughs> and then uh, a couple of years later, we, we could get in and talk about turntables. And then uh, one day he brought Joe Harley from Tone Poet, you know, he brought Joe one of his newest turntables that was all metal, metal plot. Every, and it was basically what I think is, is a great way to design a turntable, not the only way, but, and he brought it in and, and Joe said to me, he gave it to me as a gift, which is incredibly generous. And he said to Joe, Mikey was right. <laughs> and then he, then he died a couple of weeks later. You know, it's just that just it's such a shame. I mean, that is a pinnacle table for him. And uh, what a nice guy. So, and that table is what they're making now. That's yep. what they're and yep. I want to get one to review and I still haven't managed to get to his his organization to get one. And I heard the table of Joe's. It is fantastic turntable. Yeah, that's awesome. OK, um, so. Tell us a couple of your favorite products right now. I'll tell you the weirdest favorite product. OK company called computer audio design and uh he, he makes a it's a passive box and it's just got these metal laminates in it of some kind and it's a it's designed to drain noise from your system this sounds very esoteric and baloney but it's designed to drain noise from your system he, and his uh he's a computer guy and his and he's an audiophile and his contention is that Whatever you do with power conditioners or whatever you do with cables and everything else, the noise is riding along on the ground plane throughout your whole system, throughout all your AC and into all your equipment. It's, it's there and you can drain it out. And the way he drains it out is you take any one of your inputs um, that's not being used and you plug, you, you get a cable that he makes, a very thin cable that, that can handle high frequencies. We're talking about very, very high frequencies, not mm -hmm. 60 or some, but in the hundreds That's where of most of the noise is. Yeah, all the noise. And you, you connect it up to uh, an unused input and run that wire into one of these boxes and do that th in throughout your whole system. And you can experiment. There are different ways, different things you can plug it into and different pieces of gear to put it into. You can even get one of his AC cords that you plug into your AC and of course, it's not going to carry the live signal. It's 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 going to block the live signal. But just take the ground, the one ground lug that's in there, and run that into this box. Wow! And I heard about this from a manufacturer. I don't know whether you carry the brand, but for, he doesn't. Inv he's not involved in AC products. But he said, and he's a very smart man. He's been in this business forever, and I've known him forever. And he makes electronics, and he's got a factory. Anyway, I don't want to play games with you about who that might be. Okay. <laughs> here and um he says you should try this because it really works so i got the guy to send me this and uh i have three of their boxes the biggest box mm -hmm. which i have on my amplifiers and i run one of these wires and the wires are like 500 dollars. and people say well, it's a thin little piece of wire yeah but it's, it's the specially designed wire that can handle ultra super high frequencies mm -hmm. so i've got one of these boxes going to my amplifiers on unused inputs of my amplifiers and it also goes into the ac that comes into my power conditioner and goes out of my power condition. I've got one plugged into the wall and one plugged into the output of my, my uh, Niagara. And then I've got it on the front end of my system. I've got two smaller boxes. I've got one on the phono preamp, one on the preamp. One. So everything's connected. And it takes, he says it takes about a day or two before all this stuff drains out. And then you'll hear it. <laughs> it's easy to hear. Really? So easy to hear. It's That's awesome. And I bought it, I paid for it. I'm, I'm paying it off over time. I recommended it to somebody who sells very, very, very expensive gear, esoteric gear, and he got a hold of it. And uh, two days later, I, I can read you the the uh, text message he sent me. He said, he said, he said, thank you. Wait, he said, I wanna thank you for turning me on to this, Michael. I just took it, took on the, the brand. If you wanna refer to anyone demo, we've got it here and they can come over, even if they don't wanna buy my stuff, I'll demo what it, what it you know, take it out and you'll hear it. Mm -hmm. You can't just put it back in and hear it. Well, maybe, right. you, can, you know, it's right. amazing. Well, that's interesting because I will tell you that the most <laughs> probably of on all the 11 uh, chats, including this one, noise is the biggest destroyer of everything we're trying to create. 
Yeah. And um, take guys like Mike Lapis that we had on with HRS. I mean, that's a pretty amazing product. Yeah. And uh, Audio Quest, as you know, because you, <laughs> I'm in the same boat with you. I have a Niagara and about every system, and that's almost 15 systems in the store that we've got one in. And uh, yeah, Garth knows what he's he knows what he's doing. You know, he's not. You know, he's not. He a, does. I got to run this computer audio design thing by him and see what he says. <laughs> You can imagine how much fun that'll be. Yeah, well, it, well, it doesn't replace the Niagara. It's right. an auxiliary thing. But you try it and see what you think. That's all you can say to people. Yep. Try it and see what you think. Well, I'll take a look into it. So um, anyway, um, listen, I want you all, if you will, please ask questions. Uh, we're getting ready to get in the Q&A part with uh, Michael Frimmer here. He, again, is editor for Analog Planet and Stereo, Stereophile Senior Contributing Editor. Yeah, um I, Michael, I just want to thank you so much for doing this today. Um, we uh, are kind of done with our questions here, but I'm sure we've got quite a few in the line there. And uh, as a matter of fact, I can see we do. And uh, I just, you know, taking your time out of your busy schedule and that kind of thing to do this and just kind of helping reaching out to people. And I appreciate you letting know uh, your folks about this as well. So anyway, thank you very much. Sure, it's my pleasure. It really is. All right. So we're going to start off some Q&A here. You ready? I'm ready. <laughs> You've never been asked questions before, so <laughs> I'll say one right. thing. Before you start, I'll say one thing. I'm yes. not encyclopedic. You know, say, what are the three best? This can I'm not like that. I can't off the top of my head do that, but I'll do the best I can. Okay, that's it. Um, all right. So this is from Jeff B. Okay. Hey Jeff, I have a VPI TNT3 with SDS, but with broken Gram 1.5T arm wand. Would you replace the Gram arm and keep the TNT? Which arms to consider under fifteen hundred bucks, or sell the TNT SDS and replace with a new VPI Prime Signature or JM Fat Boy Arm Max Budget sixty five hundred or something else? Okay, so I owned a TNT, and I know you did. Yeah, and, and that was my first, my second really good turntable. And you know, Harry Wessel designed that turntable specifically for the Eminent Technology uh, air bearing yeah, ET two. Yeah, yeah, because a large mass is being moved horizontally and if you're if if you have like a suspension a three-part suspension it's going to move the whole thing's going to in fact i put an et1 on a uh, oracle turntable it's the stupidest thing i ever did <laughs> i didn't know any better so, so as i was playing a record the whole the whole table it was three springs the whole table I, I think i got one of those in on trade an oracle with i might have gotten that table <laughs> so, that table was owned by roger corman's son the film director and he traded really it. okay many stories um so it's it's a good turntable but this i think there's a lot you know, it's a lot of mass and a lot of acrylic and i think you could do better with a more compact turntable yep a VPI i would agree prime, i think a vpi prime you know a scout prime, that would be the one you're talking about would be probably a better turntable yeah yeah the, the prime signature with the fat boy yeah i would absolutely agree with that so, um, all right, Jeff, thank you. I hope that helps. And uh, if you have more questions, you're welcome to uh, uh, call me directly here at the store. I'm happy to try and help, okay? Uh, this is from Hank A. Uh, hey, Hank, uh, wondering if you have had a chance to listen to the Brinkman Taurus, and if so, what do you think of it? I've, you know, like I, like I said at the beginning of this interview, I, uh, reviewed a, uh, <laughs> I reviewed a cartridge that I've already reviewed. I've reviewed so many Brinkmans I know I reviewed, no, I didn't review the Taurus. I didn't do that. You had a lot of affinity for the balance, I know, because I, I remember seeing your comments there. I was going to buy a balance uh, when the continuum came along, and then, and then I did that. The balance is a wonderful, just a wonderful turntable to this day, because they haven't changed it in all those years. Well, what, nothing to change. Um, well, the Taurus came out in January. Right. Okay. I played it at the show. Haven't heard it. But isn't that, isn't that kind of like a, it's like a spider, but with a direct draw? It, it's actually it's actually kind of between the, the Bardo is their entry level direct drive and this is a beefed up I hate to call it version of that because it's actually much more advanced than that yeah so it's a little it's kind of between the balance and the uh, and the Bardo yeah I haven't heard it but I've heard a lot of their turntables they're they're, they're great turn I like all their turntables Hel helmet's a pretty smart dude he is a very smart dude yeah <laughs> so you can't go wrong buying one of those turntables I I would agree. I would agree. It's all very, very, very good engineering, and the company is very solid. I like his biggest. I think it's one of his arms I like better than the other, but that's yeah. The twelve point one inch is my favorite of his. Uh, so, all right. Uh, thank you, Hank. Uh, Michael P. 
What are your thoughts on the return of vinyl into the mainstream and the cultural implications for analog in the future? Okay, there's good and bad. You know, I tell people, if you're buying a $65 turntable to play a $30 pressing of Dark Side of the Moon, something's wrong with that. <laughs> there's something wrong with that picture. You know, it, it's an issue uh, when people are buying really cheap turntables because they're not going to have a good experience over time. They're just not. And I'm, I'm afraid that some of those people are gonna just lose interest and get out. Uh, you know, the, the minimal turntable worth buying to me is a, there's an Audio-Technica for a couple of hundred dollars. That's actually okay. It'll get you going. Mm -hmm. But if, you know, you go to Barnes and Noble, I, I, had a, I, went, I was invited by Barnes and Noble to go down to their uh, Orlando, Florida convention, manager's convention to explain to them why they're selling a lot of records. Because they didn't know. It's really funny, you know. They, they you just tell them because of me. Yeah, they, <laughs> they let them say that, which they did, which is very, very nice. But uh, they said, "Could you do us a favor? We have all these, all these uh, managers of our store saying, I know you put records in there. Uh, we thought that was a stupid idea, but they we're selling a lot of records, and people are coming into the store. Could you, you know, why is that?" So I went down there and I explained it to them, and I, I came right out and said, "Don't sell these sixty-five dollar turntables. Yep. You know the Crosley Cruisers. Don't." It's not a good thing. Yeah, Michael, I think one of the things I've had people come in and ask me, so, well, you know, I don't want to go too far because I don't know if I'm going to like it or not. And I tell them you're probably not going to like it if you don't go far enough. Right. And if you oh. can't invest $200 in a turntable or 250 or 225 don't get involved because you're going to spend that much money on records so quickly you won't yeah. know. And you will do that. You know, we, nobody has ever come to me and said, you know, I, I read your stuff for the years and I, I, I said, all right, I'll buy a turntable. I bit. And you know what? You're an idiot. It's the worst thing I ever did. No, no, never. Not once. Everybody's yep. thank you. Thank you for getting me back. Yep. Or thank you. You made me push the switch and get a turntable. And I listen to more music now. And I can sit and listen for hours. I couldn't do that before. Why, why is that? And then I can explain it to them. But yeah. Well, I think one of the beautiful things about it is it makes people actually listen to an album and not track, 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 track. Yes. And, you know, it, it's just, I mean, I, I love the artistry of, of, of putting albums together and putting songs in right orders and that kind of thing. And what's funny is I had a lady here in town who actually put an album together of her own and I was trying to help her rearrange the tracks so that, <laughs> so that it would, it would, I think, come along and she actually went my way and uh, I think she's done fairly well with it. So anyway, oh, excited about that. Of, you know, arranging tracks so it side ends in a certain way and starts again. I mean, people, yep. say, well, people sit and listen to records because they have to, because the record, that it's not because of that. It really isn't. It's because there's something about the sound of it mm -hmm. that draws you in and relaxes you. I've got, I've got like one of the best DAX and SACD players combos here that you can get. Mm -hmm. I pay for it. It's great. I use it and I have a rune nucleus with 7,000 files on, and I use that as a reviewing tool. I enjoy listening to it too, but it's, this is what it is. Yep. As good as it gets. This is really good now. Yeah. You know what? This is really, it's great. And I do enjoy it. I put the same thing on a record. Uh, yep. It's that brain noise. Yeah. Brain noise. That's exactly what it is. And yep. until people hear that, and I will tell you that that's that's where the audio quests like power cables and stuff like that, man, it brings that brain noise down. Like I just can't even believe the way it'll settle a system. I can't either. Can I, I tell the just, story of how I got how what happened when I got those cables and can I tell us quickly? Yeah. You know, any brand. So I had a I had a brand of AC cables, thought they were great, which they were, and I that was my reference cable. And then I I used their reference power conditioning stuff, it's very good. And then, and I went to their factory. They know what they're doing. They're smart guys. They're not some of these clowns that buy a, make a T filter and a big capacitor in a box. They know what they're doing. And then uh, I got the, this audio quest to review and it was like, wow, this is just that much better. So I'm going to get this. So I got that. Yep. And pretty quickly, the other company asked for their AC cables back. I understand it. I mean, I, that was on loan. I said, I, can I keep them until I get a replacement? They said, yes. I got the replacement, which, which were these dragon cables. I put them in and I wasn't thinking about AC cables. I was just putting, I was gonna do listening later. I put them in because I had to, because I had no cables otherwise. I put them in. The first record I played was the reissue that Bob Ludwig did of their Satanic Majesty's Request by the Rolling Stones. It was from a DSD file and I cut the vinyl and I put it on and I'm playing and I'm going, oh my God, this is, I never heard their Satanic Majesty's Request sound like this. Right. It's so open and transparent, and I, I'm hearing stuff in, in the background, little percussive instruments. I've never heard that stuff before. The transparency is insane. This reissue is brilliant. 
And I said, but wait, before I write this review, I better go listen to my original UK pressing that I've been playing since 1966. I better play that. I put that and I went, oh my God, it's so transparent. It's the <laughs> same thing. <laughs> and that was- well, it is, it is um, you know, I've had, uh, I, I've always kind of equated noise to going into a noisy restaurant and you go in there and if it's really noisy, your brain becomes really alive and awake. And it's like not comfortable, but it's very alive and awake. And yet you can go into a restaurant that actually has kind of decent acoustics. And even though everybody might be talking, you're very relaxed when you walk in it. So noise is an important thing for our brain and reducing it or not reducing our brain, <laughs> but, but taking down you know, the, the tenseness of it or that kind of thing, because we're trying to get emotionally attached to the music. That's the reason we do this. And yeah. even though at first glance, even though at first glance, we think when that noise is there, it's like, wow, listen to that. Yeah. But then when we get rid of that noise, we kind of go, oh man, listen to that. And it's more pernicious when it's noise you're not really hearing. It's yes. the absence of it. That yes. You it. Yes. That's why I'm saying when you get this, if you get that CAD stuff and you experiment with it in a system <laughs> in the right way, I, Give it a day or two and the liquidity that happens. I'm all over it. I'm, I'm big on this noise thing. <laughs> and if you don't hear it, I want you to do a video and I want you to go on your website and call me an idiot. Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be kind. All right. So um, let's see, Michael, uh, thank you for your question. Sorry, guys, for going off on the big rant, but uh, I think it's important for you to know that. Um, all right. So uh, Leo, what album? This time, can you pick two do you grab if you have to leave the house in an emergency? Great question, Leo. Wow. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Out of all those? The house is blowing up. Woo. I would, I, wow. I think I, I'd probably grab my, uh, first I'd grab my, my original British pressing of Rubber Soul that George Martin signed for me. Uh -huh. I grab that. And then, uh, Oh man, be because I can't replace it. That's what it would be. You know, this has to be a record you cannot replace. So that would be one very difficult. Couldn't replace that. And then what other record do I have that you can? Since most records are replaceable one way or another, if you have enough money, it would have to be. I guess I would pull my copy of uh, of Queen's first album, the British pressing, where I have inserted a letter that Brian May wrote to me, a two page letter that he sent me. Because I did uh -huh. national radio spots for the first three Queen albums, and one day I get this letter in the mail, you know, one of those airmail letters, and I open it. It's a two-page handwritten letter from Brian May, telling wow. me that my commercials for, for that my editing of their music in my commercials for their records were more interesting than their own edits on the albums. I have that. <laughs> <laughs> I would grab that, and I told my wife, I said, "I'm going to show you where this stuff is because if I drop dead, which I will at some point, you shouldn't, you know, you should know where all this, this all this stuff hidden in there in these records and sick autographs and stuff. Let me show you. Where, no, I don't care. So someday someone's going to get that. So I would grab that because that letter is, I, I treasure that. Most of the records I could replace one way or another. You should treasure it. That was probably a, a proud moment in your world. Yeah, it have been. Yes, it was. Okay, uh, let's see. We got a question. Thank you, Leo, for the great question. And Tom H. Hey, Tom. You want to see that? Uh, Go get it. Any chance that Mike can show us his system using his phone briefly? Tom, I'm not sure we're set up to do that. Is there a place that you have a picture of your system out there? No, there's a video of it, though, on Stereophile's uh, YouTube channel. Okay. Chris, if you can see if you can find that, maybe. And uh, we'll try and put a link up there for you, Tom, okay? I just, we don't know how to do that. I'm not technically capable. <laughs> the amount of hate mail that, that engendered. Uh, What's that? The hate mail, that I get hate mail from that, that video. Uh, no, don't. The comments, this, this uh, amazing hate mail. In fact, yesterday, I got this, this guy says on, on this audio file uh, Facebook page, he goes, you're an old man sitting in a crappy room listening to your crappy stereo. It was like, wow. You know, my room, when you look at it, you look at my room in, in that video and it's like, how can this room work? It's not a big room. It's like 15 wide by 22, but it's full of stuff. So it looks a lot smaller. Mm -hmm. so they stuff these giant Sonus Faber Aida speakers and these big, these big, the biggest speakers. And when those guys came to do it, they, they walked in and the guy said, you know what? I don't think this is going to work. I said, if it doesn't work, I won't review the speakers. You know, that's one policy I've got. If a speaker doesn't work, I'm not going to review it. I'm not right. going to the speaker. That would, be, that would be unfair. Yeah. So we set them up. And they were just completely blown away. It worked for whatever reason. 
and you know, so your room just works, even with big products in that size of room. There is a bump, there's a a bass bump in there, but you don't hear it. And people say, well, of course you hear it. Look at it. And I tell people what Siegfried Linkwitz, you know, Siegfried Linkwitz, very famous uh, uh, speaker designer, and he designed the Link the yep. Linkwitz Riley uh, crossover thing. Yep. He said I interviewed him when he was in hospice on his deathbed, and he he said to me. There's a lot of death in this conversation. And I'm sorry about that, but this is the fact. He said to me, remember this, I'm a big measurement guy, but your ears are made for listening and your eyes are made for looking and don't listen with your eyes. So when you see measurements, don't listen with your eyes. You have to know how to interpret those measurements correctly. And yeah, there's a bump in my room, but you don't hear it. I can't explain why you don't, but these Russian guys, I was at an event in New York at a store doing a turntable setup seminar. And this, these guys said, we, we're two Russian and we're engineers. We, we don't like vinyl, and uh, but we see your room, big bass, boom, boom. How do, you, how do you live with this boom, boom bass in your room? I said, I don't have boom. Why don't you guys come over? Bring your CDs. You, you invite us to your room, come on over. So they came over. It's two guys and they sit there and they're playing their CDs and they're going back and forth and they're whispering and he goes, you're right, good, this room sounds good. Let me play you a record. We don't like records. I said, let me, you're here, let me play one record. So I played them this record. Let's play share this record. This is an insane record. This is Porky and Bess on Decca and you can find the, the London record version. It's the same record. And this is a, a Ken Wilkinson recording done in, in Cleveland. It's insane. I played them a track from this. And Harry, Harry Weiswell, Harry Pearson's review of this said, this recording is so good when they roll the dice at the beginning of the record, you can see what the number, what, what the dice lands on. <laughs> so, oh, wow. <laughs> that, that's Harry. So you know, this record, uh, we don't, I don't hear pops and clicks. How come there's no pops and clicks? That, that's incredible. We'll get CD. I said, the CD is not going to sound like that. I promise you. We'll get CD. <laughs> so two weeks later, I get a call. We not got so like that. You're right. CD doesn't sound like that. Why is that? I said, I don't know. You are the engineer. You explain it to me. <laughs> awesome story. All right, Tom, uh, thank you for that. By the way, I believe there's a link up uh, that Chris posted on the video uh, that's on the uh, Stereo Files uh, website. Yeah. So I uh, appreciate you taking care of that, Chris. Y'all please ask some questions. Uh, we've got quite a few left. Uh, so let's see, Jeff B. Uh, can you tell the story about the Japanese couple who poked holes in his old New, New Jersey listening room ceiling? Best of the listening room sound ever. Uh, yes, I can do that. I hope I get it correct. So at one point, someone, no, I know who it was who told me this. It was uh, another guy that just passed away. Uh, Victor Goldstein, who got COVID-19 and died. So when anybody tells you this is a, a fake virus. Anyway, Victor was a great guy. He's another mentor of mine who, who uh, when I first got to the Absolute Sound, I went into uh, met Harry for the first time. That's just a whole nother story. Um, I met Victor. He was the Jadis guy and, and uh, he was a Romanian gentleman. He took me and Frank Doris, who some of you may know, under his wing and he uh, he he taught me a lot about classical music. He was a very sophisticated classical music lover and a very sophisticated listener. And uh, he was also a food connoisseur and a wine connoisseur. And he taught me about Italian wines and Italian food, just a great guy. And so one day he called me and he said, you know, Michael, there, there is a, a couple uh, that uh, they treated the uh, audition room at Carnegie Hall where the musicians go to try out. I did this impression for him, by the way. So it's not insulting to me for you. There's nothing. <laughs> Um, these, this Japanese guy went into the audition room at Carnegie Hall where they sell in instruments. If you want to try out your violin, you go into this room and you, and you audition it in this room. And this Japanese guy and his wife went into this room and did their treatment. It's called, it's, it's called a, Ray, a Riley wave. You can look it up. I think it's R-A-Y-L-E-I-G-H, I think. Anyway, it's, it's the way sound travels on hard surfaces. It, it, that's what it's involved with. And again, I am not a scientist. I only play one on television. And uh, they treated this, what they would do is they'd walk around the, this room, this auditioning room, and, they, and the guy would have this piece of paper or whatever, and he'd go like this, go like this, and his assistant would make a note. And this guy had a, a big pony, long ponytail, a very, a certain Japanese look, a cool Japanese look. And they'd walk around, they walked around the whole room and made, you know, doing this thing and making notes. And when they were done, they took an awl and they punched holes in certain places in the floor of 
and in the wallboard of this room. And you can't even see it. And then what would happen is people would come in who were very experienced musicians who would use that audition room all the time. And they'd walk in there and they'd go, whoa, this room doesn't sound like it used to sound. What, you know, what, what's going on? It was what this guy did. So Victor said, I can get this guy to come to your house and treat your room. Would you like to have that experience? I said, yeah, sure. So they came over and they, now my room was crowded with stuff and I had a dropped ceiling in this, in this house. So they couldn't, well, they still did. They, they punched, they went and walked through the house and they were doing this and do that. They made, punch, took the oil and made certain holes in, in the um, molding around the room. They couldn't do the floor because the floor was concrete, but they did what they could. And then they did, did the ceiling also. And when they were done, what ended up happening is the, the room modes, for some reason, you could walk around the room and, there, and it sounded the same it, all around the room. There were not places where it got louder and soft. It was the same all around. You could hear it. And I don't know where they are now or if it, yeah, that's what happened. Somebody needs to pick up on that. <laughs> it sounds like what a great story. Jeff B, thank you very much. I appreciate that. They worked in car stereo too, and they would treat people's uh, upholstery by punching holes in it. It was not a good idea. <laughs> All right. So we've got, uh, let's see, again, Jeff B, thank you very much for the question. So Ruby Area 58, uh, hey there. Uh, were you surprised by the response to New York Times piece on ERC? Oh, first of all, I don't know whether you saw that. I was so happy that he wrote that story. And uh, I was doubly happy that he took the time to come over to listen here before writing the story. So um, this is Ben Cesario from the Times and he, he decided to do a story on, uh, on the electric recording company. And uh, so Pete Hutchison was nice enough to send him some of the records and he sent him one of the Joanna Marzi um, Bach uh, violin, solo violin records. Mm -hmm. And that record was also released by Coup de Char, uh, cut at Abbey Road using solid state gear. And he got a copy of that. And he got a copy of a new Korean as a CD that was released from the same tape. And uh, he came over to hear it in my place. That record, by the way, uh, it was $300 new. That's what they charge for their records, 300 bucks, 300 copies. People get, go crazy why he does that. He's an eccentric guy, that's what he does. Okay, that's what he does. And uh, a copy of that sold on, uh, on one of these resale sites just last week for $3,300. Wow. So you buy these records, they're expensive, but they're investments. You're not going to lose your money. You'll make money. When that company came out uh, and I heard about it, I sent the guy an email. I said, I don't expect freebies, uh, you know, but if you could give me an accommodation price on some of these, I would appreciate it. But he sends them all to me. Wow. And I'll sell them because that would be a terrible thing to do. So I keep, anyway, so Ben came over and he um, sat down and we, we played, first we played the coup de char version, which is, He's never heard a good, the guy never heard a really good stereo. And he's got a very moderate, he's a music reviewer for the Times, but he has a moderate stereo. And uh, he never heard a really good stereo. And so he, I could tell he, his mind was blown, but he didn't want to, he didn't want to let on to it too much. Right, because he's supposed to be an expert too. That's right. And then I, we played uh, the ERC. And the first thing he said was, wow, she's right there playing. I didn't get that experience before. It was good. That was good. The, the previous record was good. And it, and it it was like an image, you know, mono record. It was, it was obviously an old, old recording, but the mono image was right there. The speakers weren't even playing and it was right there. And that was amazing. But when, when, the, when you put on the ERC version cut from that tube system, it was like, there was a woman there playing. I could feel her bowling the instrument. I, it, it, that was insane. I said, okay, let's play the CD. We put the CD and I've got a, I've got a DCS Vivaldi one. It's a damn good <laughs> CD player. Yes, it is. We've sold a couple of them. So, and I, paid for it and i put it on and two seconds he goes it's not there there's nothing there what why is that i guess i can't explain it to you i can't explain it to you and he wrote what he heard which was fantastic for that to be in yep. a main publication and there was a link to uh to, to the website which was you know yep. my website you want to know my website traffic not not yeah <laughs> <laughs> kind, of, kind of helpful to it. You just see a little, a little hockey stick. <laughs> All right. Hey, listen, thank you very much for that question, Ruby era 58. And again, from him, I have another question. Also, he just ordered from ERC, one of his favorite albums of all time, 
love forever changes, supposedly true mono. Any chance you're familiar on, on this versus stereo? Okay, well, here's the, here's, this is what, this is the fire I was putting out when, when, we, when I first called. So, uh, you know, I will apologize to you on camera, whereas I apologized on the website. Uh, so I have a mono copy of that record. And I always wondered whether it was a real mono mix or whether it was just a fold down from stereo because they would do that in that by the, by the mid to late sixties when stereo was getting a lot bigger, they wouldn't do a separate mono mix. They would just do a fold down so that it would play on the radio and not have issues on, on mono radio. Uh, I was led to believe, and I don't know whether this was a screw up from ERC or my mistake, but I was led to believe because I, I could swear I read something about how you know it's the mono mix because there's a different something different in a certain track where a certain track starts or stops. And I put on the website that this is a, a not a fold down, but a true mono mix. But in fact, he got back to me from ERC and said, no, it's a fold down from the stereo tape. And so this is one of those cases where I feel really bad. And I hope that he will honor that if someone says, hey, I bought that, I don't want the mono. I don't know why you would want a mono fold down of a stereo mix. I don't, you know, I understand a mono mix. Just keep it in stereo. Yeah. yeah, I would rather have the mono mix of Sonny Rollins Way Out West because the stereo mix is Sonny's on this channel and the rest of them are over there. Yeah. And that was done because, so they could fold it into and make a mono mix. Why would I want, you know, it's like Art Pepper meets the rhythm section. So that's another thing. <laughs> Art Pepper is playing over here. The rhythm section is playing over there. In, in reality, Art Pepper never meets the rhythm section on that record. Now, now Michael, if you get your if you get your speakers on wheels, you can just move them really close together. Yeah, and if you have a mono <laughs> switch, you're doing the same thing basically yeah. that they did in the studio when they did a fall. So I don't know why he did that. But again, uh, okay. Well, appreciate appreciate you putting that out there for him. So uh, there's your answer, Rubiera fifty eight. Um, let's see, uh, Fernando C. Hello, Fernando. Do you have a recommendation for a phono preamp under 3K for MC? Uh, I do, and it's only available by, um, by mail order. Is it okay if I do that? Sure. Sorry. Uh, you know, the PS Audio Stellar is a, uh, I'm sorry that he, they stopped selling to dealers. It's, it's an it's amazing piece of gear. Uh, and, uh, from, I reviewed it and it's, I had it in my system for a really long time. I've got a, a $55,000 phone preamp that I own on one side and a $55,000 preamp I have on the other side. And those are better, but this thing is incredibly good. And the guy that designed it, uh, Darren Meyer, is, is, a gen, is a young genius. And um, when, when he joined PS Audio, I got invited to, uh, to interview him at an at a REMF or Axpona, I forgot what it was, but the, the, the publicist said, come, come and meet this guy and interview him. So I sat down, set up my camera and I said, hi, uh, you know, my, he says, oh, I know who you are. I said, you know, I gotta tell you that I am in this business now because when I was a kid, I sent you an email and asked for your advice about what I should do if I wanna be in high-end audio. And you said to me, uh, get a degree in something related to this, get an get engineering degree, do something where it's a real, don't do how I ended up in this, get a real legitimate degree, maybe engineering. And then, and he did, he got an engineering degree and he reviews by listening, even though he's an engineer and by measuring. And right. he, doesn't, he doesn't let the measurements rule what he's doing. He doesn't apply gigantic amounts of feedback to everything to make the measurements perfect. He listens and it's an amazing piece. It's a fantastic. And I reviewed it and everybody that bought one and got back to me, I bought it off your review and you're right. It's incredible. And it is. That's you know. Yep. Well, I've heard good things about it. We sell a, a thing called an EAT Petite Glow here with that separate power supply. I, I, I could. Pretty, I could. Pretty awesome it. product. I've been uh, very, very impressed with that. But uh, awesome, uh, Fernando. Thank you very much. We appreciate that. All right, we got Michael P here. Hello, Michael. Which are your favorite Beatles vinyl pressings in terms of pure audio? Original UK, Japanese eighties, Odeon, recent reissues. Okay, so. I'm prejudiced towards the uh, the mono box set because I had a hand, a small hand in that, and mm -hmm. those are better than the mono originals. Anybody who thinks the mono originals are better than those, I mean, they're, slight, they're different in different ways, but right. ultimately the, the the reissues are definitely better because the originals were frequency limited on the bottom, completely cut the base, 
you know, there was a guy, there was a guy, this is an apocryphal story, but I think it's true. There was a guy at EMI whose whole job was to take test pressings and make sure that they would track on these kitty phonographs. In, in, the, in the mid sixties, there were only three kitty phonographs you could buy in the UK. And he had wow. all three of them sitting there and they would do a test pressing. And if it wouldn't track, it was called a hopper or a kangaroo cut because it would jump like a kangaroo <laughs> and they'd have to recut it. And so they would have to compromise the bottom end and even on the mono pressings. And so if you play a mono, I heard the tapes. I was lucky enough to hear the tapes. The tapes have really good bass and the records don't. And so these reissues, the mono reissues, are much better than the originals, except in one, one regard. The originals were cut on a tube console and mm -hmm. reissues are on a solid state console that's a little bit hard on top. You know, so uh, the, the white album, the, the original has a little bit better top end. And if you read what I wrote in my review, I wrote that the top end's a little bit more luxurious and open the way tubes can be, but mm -hmm. the bottom end's not nearly as good. So uh, the mono, the, the uh, box, Otherwise, the, the, I like the British uh, um, originals. If you can find a Parlophone original British stereo, those are fantastic. O the Odeon red label monos were good, but again, I, I think that the reissues uh, that were done more recently are actually, I've got some of those Odeons and, and they're good, but I think the reissues are better. So, awesome. There you have it. I, uh, you know, it's uh, amazing to me that you can take this thing that drives the cutter head and hook up a tube amp and a solid state amp and get something totally different. It's kind of like putting a tube power supply by Brinkman on his balanced turntable. And all it does is spin the motor. It's amazing that it can have that big of a difference in it. No, it doesn't. It's confirmational bias. <laughs> you're hearing the difference of that. Well, then, I, then, I, then I'm going to have to stay biased. <laughs> Not hard to hear that difference either. It really is. No, it isn't. And even the helmet says, I don't really understand why, but you know, it does. So there it is. I'm grab, while you're getting asked the next question, I'm going to grab two records for you. All right. Sounds great. All right. Uh, so, uh, Michael P., thank you very much. I appreciate that. Hope you got your answer. All right. Uh, let's see. James N., is the cartridge or turntable the most part, the most important part of the system, or is it better to spend about the same amount of money on a turntable and cartridge? That's a hard question to answer. The Depends on what it is. Yeah, I'll say this. The transducer is the most important part of the whole thing because that's what's doing the changing the mechanical energy into electrical energy. And that, that's the most colored device. It's the least linear device. So that doesn't make the biggest difference. But then you've got to make sure that your front end turntable, your, your, especially your, your, your tone arm, can handle the better cartridge. So it's really a balance. But I would rather... I would tell somebody to get spend the most money they can on the turntable and then compromise on the cartridge for now until you can afford a better cartridge. Because if you compromise on the turntable, you're yep. only gonna have you can't get anywhere. Yeah. Yep. You agree, right? And you're a retailer. So. Yep. And one thing I would say, James, in that as well is to, is to think of also this phono stage as the biggest amplifier in your system. And it also has RIA equalization, depending on what anybody wants to call that, but um, has that in there as well. So there's a lot going on in a phono stage, and it can have a dramatic effect on uh, what you get out of the cartridge and turntable. So it's kind of like a three-piece system in that regard, not two-piece. And there are great ones that aren't that expensive either. That's that is correct. We're, we're seeing, you know, that's what's amazing to me when I think of the sound that we used to get for a thousand bucks in a turntable and what we pay for that today to get. Um, pretty amazing. Right. Yep. Plus, the records are better than ever. The new records, yep. theoretically, are. So I, I brought two, uh, ah. two Japanese pressings of uh, the Hey Jude album. Okay. This is an EMI made in Japan, and this was the first Japanese record I ever bought. And when I played this record for the first time, I completely flipped out because it is so quiet in the background. The pressing is so perfect. It was like, and the music jumped out of it. It was like insane. And then I made the stupidest decision of my life and started replacing all my records with Japanese pressings. <laughs> a really stupid idea. All these great British pressings that were the original source and were great, but I said, these Japanese are better. I got rid of all those records for these Japanese pressings and then I realized my mistake and started buying back my British pressings. Fortunately, I bought them back at a time when nobody cared about vinyl. Like I got the right. whole Stones catalog back for $9 a record. Thank God, all the British pressings. Wow. So here's another version. This is a somewhat later one. 
And this one is so much better than this one that it's ridiculous. Wow. This, it's, that I thought was so great is bright and hard. And this one is spectacular. So all across the map. Yeah. That's one of the reasons, again, I appreciate your, your really great reviews out there. So it really helps us all kind of guide. And, you know, my thing with you guys, there's so much information out there now. I know you're swimming in a sea of it. Yeah. And uh, my thing is uh, make sure you're talking to people that know what they're doing and uh, you'll probably wind up in a better road and spend less money in the long term. Um, so James N, thank you so much. Uh, again, if you want to discuss that at all, um, I'm happy to take a call here. I've got a couple of uh, vinyl experts here as well that'd be very happy to help you along that path. Um, so the next question is from Brad O. Hello, Brad. Is your, is your turntable setup DVD available for download? Uh, no. It's only available as a as a, uh, a hard copy. The second DVD I did, it's a, it's a vinyl world after all, is uh, I'm going to finally get it as a download. It's not ready yet. I have the video. I don't have the audio sync to the video. It's one of these things I have to do. It's been two years I've been meaning to do it, but it's very hard to find the time, but I want to do that because it's a fun video. It's it's pressing. I go to two pressing plants to show you how the pressing plants work and it shows record storage and record cleaning. And again, to a certain degree, it's been superseded because there's much better ways of cleaning records now than I, you could do 14 years ago. Mm -hmm. but, uh, that's another story we could talk about. Yeah, <laughs> but, uh, It's a fun video because I go to, I go to a uh, palace in Germany and I go to RTI and you see in close up how, how the different presses work. So, but it's, that's that's pretty awesome. Um, so anyway, great to see the download soon. Uh, we have put a link up to your DVD right now. So anybody wants that, that's pretty easy to get to. Um, Brad O again, I have $100 to spend on turntable setup tools. What should I buy? Wow. Well, the most important thing- A beer. Is, first of all, <laughs> a beer. You, it depends what turntable you have. If you have a, a turntable like a, a Technics where you can set the vertical tracking force without getting a, a gauge, and it's pretty accurate, then don't, you don't need a gauge. So you, your hundred bucks can go elsewhere. If you don't have any way to set tracking for us, you need a gauge and mm -hmm. you need to spend the money on one of these little digital gauges because they're not expensive these days. And, the, and right. that's important. It's amazing. They used to be three, 400 bucks. Now you can buy them for 59 or 49 $800 or whatever. $800 for the first wins gauge, which was good to only one digit. Wow. Two digits. It would, it would do, it would do like 3.2 grams. Well, I remember having to do the balance beams. <laughs> yeah, the sure that was for different stuff um <laughs> i thought we're not going there alan we are all right so so really buy something to, to make sure you get your cartridge weight right is probably the, the top the recommendation overhang, the overhang gauge that most hopefully most turntables come with is going to get the job done even the regal one the piece of paper it'll get the job done um so yeah you can't get much for for that kind of money all right, so, <laughs> dude, <laughs> I'm going to try and ask this. All right, this is from Brad O as well. Do Michael's alter egos, like Mike Ayala, for instance, have different taste in music? Uh, yeah, I don't, I will not do, I, you know, it's reached the point now, you can't, you can't do uh, ethnic accents, which I love doing. I, I've noticed. Yeah, I love doing <laughs> I can't do, uh, you know, I can't, I can't, especially, no, I can't go there. Um, no, I won't answer that question. Okay. <laughs> yeah, because, you know, my Japanese Fair. accent is great. My, my British accents are pretty good. I, they're, they're pretty good accents. And, uh, uh, all right. So this is from Brad O again. In your opinion, what is the best opera recording available today? Best opera recording? Uh, well, first of all, that that uh, Porgy and Bess, if you want to put that in the category of opera, is if you can get that one. This one is it's an astonishing recording, and it has a uh, very good people in it. Porgy and Bess, which is of course very accessible. Yeah. So that's a great one. Uh, a lot of the RCA Living Stereos, uh, Turando. I can show you that one if you want. I can dig it up. And operas are not collectible for some reason. For some reason, operas have not gained the collectability in the classical music world as much as a lot of the symphonic music. And I don't know why that is, but let me see if I can dig this one out of here. I think a lot of people's first exposure to opera is not a positive one. I'm not I'm sure never... if I'll find this one. 
let's see. Yeah, I did. I found it. You know, you can find this one at uh, usually at like Goodwills. It's Torando and it's it's a living stereo and it was recorded in, I think it was recorded in Milan. It's yeah. phenomenal. I actually went and saw it here in it's Atlanta. It's got a Tobaldi, Bridget Nilsson, uh, Giorgio Tozzi. It's a great record in Italy. I'll do it. They don't care. They're okay with me doing the accent. And this one's great. You got, you got a book. You got a full book. It's a beautiful book. And <laughs> You know, it's a three records, and you got to turn it over and over, but so what? It's okay. It's a really good one. It's a good one. It's a tough opera. I went to see it. So, <laughs> all right. So, uh, another question from Brad O. And it says, hypothetically, your nephew has shown an interest in music and LPs. Which system do you buy for him? Well, how much money you got? Yeah. Well, it's how much money you got because you're buying it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I helped my 14 year old genius writer, Malachi, get an upgraded system. So, uh, you know, having a 14 year old writer who's amazing is, it's a great thing. I don't have any kids and it's yes. like, this kid came out of nowhere and uh, he was a big fan of mine at, at 12. And, and I met him because my, my electrician text messaged me and said, hey, this is a kid on the radio because he was on the radio already at 12. Mm -hmm. uh, talking about pressing plants and mastering engineers and vinyl formulations. He must be like 12 years old. You must know him, right? I said, I don't know him. And two seconds later, he, he texted again and said, he just name checked you. He knows who you are. I said, well, did you get his name? He got his name. I went on my website. This kid was all over my website, sounding like a 40 year old. He was all over my YouTube channel, sounding like a 40 year old, you know, making these statements that were like, how is this possible? So I responded to one and his mother got back and he said, oh, he, he talks about you all the time. That's all he talks about. Can we come over, please? We're in New Jersey. I said, yes. <laughs> go on my YouTube channel and you can watch when we first met. I mean, you know, he, he comes into my house and sits down and we start talking. And it was like, my sister said, is that your love child? <laughs> <laughs> no. And uh, so I helped him. He's got a pair of ELAC B5 speakers, I think they're yeah. called. Yeah, little yep. speakers. Little bookshelves for... Yeah, he's got those on stands. He's got uh, a Riga P3 that another reader, another reader watched the video and said he needs a better, he had like an inexpensive audio technical turntable. He says, he needs a better turntable. I'll send him a P3, sent him a P3. He's got a P3 with an Ortofon uh, 2M black, no, a Quintet black actually. And uh, he needs an upgrade to his uh, receiver, which is some um, Panasonic thing that gets the job done. And he's got an Arcam SACD player. So I would say, any of those inexpensive uh, ELAC speakers are great. There's some good Wharfdales. There's some good. There's a lot of good inexpensive speakers now for like. Yep, there is. Here, I'm sure we've been carrying the we've been carrying the ELAX here, and I've had Mr. Jones in the store. I mean, it's you know that's guy's done a great, great, great job. He's a genius because he, yep. he makes great inexpensive speakers, and he can make great expensive speakers too. And I roasted him, by the way. If you go on my YouTube channel, you should watch the roast. What happened is I couldn't. Nobody recorded it, unfortunately, so I had to recreate it in my house. But the gist of it was that he, he's my long lost brother. <laughs> that's so funny. You should watch it. His brother. I will, go, I will go check it out. And his brother didn't get me and didn't understand me. It was really insulted by the whole thing that I did until Andrew explained it to him. But you should watch that. It's pretty funny. All right, Brad. Thank you very much for the question. We appreciate that. And we're still getting some questions here. So appreciate it very much from you guys. This is from, uh, gosh, excuse me if I mess this up, Gil Hiram. Um, have you ever have you ever heard anything about the VOXOA turntable or have an opinion about it? I guess that would be Voxoa. VOXOA. I've never heard of that. I can't say I have either. So you know, one thing I tell there are a lot of people that, that are attracted to esoteric, non-existent brands or small tiny companies. And I get that because I review some of that stuff because I want to help people, you know, but I tell them when I review it. You don't know if this company is going to be there in two years. Right. You don't know who they are. If you're going to buy something like that, make sure it's got enough standardized parts in it that somebody can look at a schematic and fix it for you. Right. Or, you know, be careful with that because you get, you know, you save money at the beginning because nobody knows the company and they're going to sell it cheap. But then what happens? So be, right. be careful. Then you got turntables and motors and can they supply you a motor and so on. So, so many great products that are from companies that have been around for a long time and are going to continue being around. 
it's it's a it's a blend of things. I want to help new guys get started if I can, and I also want to uh, promote companies that if you buy the product, you're going to be able to get it serviced over time. I always tell my guys, my my job as a business owner is to protect you, and make sure that I'm buying from companies that can actually have a withstanding with long term, you know, withstanding ability to help take care of me and you, because otherwise I burn our relationship. You're buying. If people don't real, a lot of people don't realize that a store is owned by somebody who's like you're you're actually a consumer but on, in a different place yes they don't realize that you're a consumer and yep. you buy from companies and you have to get support from companies and you yep. can be screwed too and the decisions i have to make basically are much even though well I, I shouldn't say longer term but they kind of are um in the sense that basically i don't want problems um i want them to be able to take care of things it needs to be a high quality product they need to have a narrow-minded focus yeah. Uh, what they're doing. And I think uh, those are, you know, a few of the things that I look at when I'm looking at a manufacturer. So um, thank you very much for that. Uh, don't have a lot of comments on that. Don't know a lot about the turntable. I apologize. Uh, Chris M. Should we as vinyl collectors be concerned about the lost Apollo records plant? Uh, th that's the lacquer, the lacquer manufacturer. I think it's a somewhat less of an issue than I originally thought it was. It's still an issue. It's an issue. So, you know, Apollo Transco uh, burnt down. And uh, it's funny because when that, it's not funny, but when uh, in 1980, early 80s, I actually went to Transco in, uh, it was in New Jersey and I found out where they were. And I was one of like three people that cared about records at the, you know, people didn't care. And I went to Transco and I, uh, they were nice enough to invite me over. I learned how lacquers are made. I took pictures, I didn't have video at that point in time. I, I only have one picture that I can find. I've got to find the picture. I didn't still throw them out, I'm sure. And uh, then, trans yeah. then the, uh, Apollo bought them and moved the whole factory to California because it was a different uh, system and a different uh, product. And I said at the time, what if there's an earthquake and the whole place gets destroyed? I didn't think about a fire because I figured both of these companies have been around since forever and neither one of them had a fire, but man, it was- They probably know what a fire extinguisher is, you know, and system yeah. or whatever and, and that stuff goes up boy you know that's highly flammable mm -hmm. so uh, at first I, everybody thought that would be the end of the business then then someone said of the record business as it turned out the japanese company that makes uh, lacquers by the time the fire happened a large percentage about 20 percent of the business was uh, taken over or 25 percent was taken over by this japanese company uh, so a lot of European uh, lacquers come from uh, come from that Japanese company. A lot of people that do the mastering and pressing in Europe. Uh, everything that uh, Bernie Grunman and Kevin Gray do comes from that company. Uh, everything that a few other uh, Sterling Sound is a mix of those. I think MoFi's got a problem, but they've got a backlog of of unused lacquers. And there was a rumor that nobody wants to uh, confirm or deny that a, a, a consortium of uh, people got together before the fire and said, you know, in case there's a fire at Transco, we better buy up a, uh, a six month supply of lacquers to have on hand in case there is a fire. But nobody will confirm or deny whether there is that six month supply of lacquer sitting in some storage facility, we don't know. Uh, and there are, there's another, two other companies that are now planning to make lacquers. One of them in France has been on this case for a couple of years. It's not easy doing it correctly, but they've been planning a launch of uh, lacquers in the next couple of months. So mm -hmm. hopefully that'll happen. And uh, there's another company that I know about that's working on this as well. So it's an issue and it shouldn't be treated lightly, but it's, for so far, it hasn't become as big a problem as we expected it would be. Well, the thing is, there's so much vinyl out there. I mean, it's just, there's so much. And uh, that's why I tell everybody, I said, you know, I wouldn't worry about it too much. When you look in the used market, there's a ton of stuff to play with. If we have to wait a little bit for new stuff, that's okay. Yeah, we'll see so, how it plays. It'll be another probably six months before we, it really starts to impact. But by then, there may be this other lagger company. Yep. I hope. Yep, I hope too. Or the, or somebody finds that warehouse with the, you know, the. <laughs> they may be using that now we don't know about it because so far you know record store day is is working and uh and all this new stuff is coming out on vinyl all this weird unusual stuff that you yep my phone i'm sorry about that i can't stop it it's all right so michael we got a couple more questions ruby era 58 oh by the way chris m thank you very much for the question 
Uh, it's actually good for everybody to hear that. Uh, Rubiera 58, again, curious about Michael and uh, Alan's thoughts, pros, cons, balanced XLR output specifically from turntable. Okay, my, my opinion is that it's uh, really not necessary it, because what's coming out of the RCA is, is an inherently balanced, quote unquote, it's, it's to begin with, as long as the ground isn't tied to the, um, as long as a separate ground wire isn't tied to the RCA, like what, what Riga does, that's an issue in, in, depending on what your phone or preamp is. But for the most part, it's inherently balanced in the sense that it, the ground isn't common. And so if, if you plug an RCA into a phono preamp, it's fine, you're fine. I, I don't, it's a more secure connection. It's a better connection. You could say an XLR connection, but to me, it's, I don't get the need for there's it. There's no noise reduction. There's no amplification of gain. There's none of those things that we get out of other products that are dual fully balanced. It's, it's, it's not dual differential. So it's not canceling noise out. Exactly. Yep. yep. So, uh, not necessary. Uh, phono stage, now that's a little bit of a different story. Yeah. So once you're in. Yep. Yep. All right. So um, good Good to know we agree because otherwise we'd have just gone on forever. Um, <laughs> all right. So uh, Ruby Era 58, thank you again for the question. Uh, this is our very last question. Uh, and again, I thank you very much for your time today, Michael. Sure. Chris Mag 100, I have a pressing of an album which has a spindle hole which is not centered. I get noise when playing it. Can that damage my Hannah SL? You get noise from playing it. I don't understand. I can see why you get, you get, uh, you know, uh, wow. Right. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure why you, if you got noise, that thing, it must be because there's so, it must be so off center that you should drill another hole. <laughs> yeah, if it's that far off. I mean, I, I'd be curious to know what, can he, is he still there? He can, yes. why he gets noise? Chris, can you help us out maybe a little bit about why you get noise? What kind of noise? Yeah, what kind of noise is it? I should, yes, correct. So you try seeing if we can't get that. Listen, yeah. I want to thank you all uh, for joining us. We're going to see if we can't answer this last question while we're trying to uh, communicate there with uh, Chris Mag out there. Um, no, I, I, just don't wanna... like, I don't like playing records that are extremely eccentrically pressed. I don't want to see the stylus being, you know, really dragged a lot. It's, it's, it can't be good for the suspension to be really dragged a lot. It's, it's more robust than you think, but not a lot. Right, right. So I would... Uh... <laughs> Chris, we're seeing if we can get it there. All right. So um, anyway, thank you all so much for being here. I ask you to like and subscribe to the channel. Um, shall we say go to HiFiBuys.com and uh, sign up for our newsletter. Last week, we had Dave Gordon on HiFi Chats. Next week, we have Roger Lowe from Sonos with new products. And uh, again, want to thank all the first responders out there dealing with our crazy world right now. And um, let's see, probably talking about a while, but I'll ask. He said, he said it sounds like groove noise. Oh. I, I don't know. It could be the record could be bad in a lot of ways. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Well, can I tell you a funny Dave Gordon story? There was, sure. There was, Dave, you out there? It was a time when audio research wouldn't send me anything. A lot of companies won't send me anything. They're afraid. I don't know why they're afraid. They're afraid that, that if I don't like it, I won't give it a good review and I could hurt them, you know. But if I give I it a concern, I was concerned about having you on. Yeah. But if I give it a good review, <laughs> if I give it a good review, it sells product. I know it sells products. People tend to trust me after all this time. <laughs> <laughs> Dave Gordon had this look. I would go to audio. I'd go to the show and I'd see Dave and I'd say, Dave, why don't you send me that pH3? And he would go, that was the Dave Gordon look. And that was it. But then finally they, they sent me stuff and they gave him good reviews because they're good products. So He's just such a nice man. I loved having him on last week. Great guy. He's, uh, he's, he's, he's been a mentor for me in this business and uh, love to have him. There's a lot of great people in this business. That's what I can tell people. A lot of great people in this business. A lot yep. of really nice people in this business, and very few jerks. There are some, but they're very few. And and and, uh, and, and a lot of know about this. Can I tell you one more story? We're talking one more story. Sure. Okay. So I was in, I had a manufacturer come over to install something for me, and we went out for dinner, and. Uh, you know, the manufacturer, the part of the, the dance is the manufacturer takes you out for dinner and they, you know, and if people think I'm bought off for a dinner, then they're not going to believe anything I say. E anyway, it doesn't matter. So in, for this particular dinner, it was a BYO. I brought the wine. You never see that. That was a miracle. I brought a really good bottle of wine. And we're sitting there talking in this BYO. And we have, we, it was an hour and a half conversation. And we're talking. At the end, a guy comes up at the next table 
and he says, you know, I know who you are. And I, I have to admit, I eavesdropped on the entire conversation. I listened to everything that you were saying and I, I, I'm apologizing for it, but you know what? It really surprised me. What you said, what this whole conversation was totally surprised me because I had a very cynical viewpoint on the business. And I thought, if I listen to this conversation, you guys were gonna be talking about what the review was gonna say and how, maybe how much money you were gonna pay for it or, or uh, I don't know what I was expecting, but it wasn't what I got. What I got was a totally honest conversation where he explained his product to you and you asked him questions. And, and then you talked about other things in the business and uh, on a very professional business-like level. And there was not, not, it wasn't what I was expecting. And I kind of feel foolish because of what I thought this business was like. And it's what a not great story at all. And I said, but I'm glad you eavesdropped. But I knew who you were too, so we were on our best behavior. No, <laughs> but, but seriously, what a great story! I think what 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 I uh, I think I'm always uh, amazed at seeing people's responses to the kind of engineering levels uh, that these people go to in this business. You take Mike from HRS, look at his background. My gosh, go listen to that Hi-Fi Chats. Uh, take Richard Vanderstein, go and listen to his Hi-Fi Chats. That man is, you know crazy um so you'll find there's an awful lot of that around of people that are they're just very passionate they want to move this forward in any way they can Great. and all of them because they are some very ingenious minds believe they have the right way yeah and that's I why we have so many different things and not everything built in one way i helped uh roy halley you know roy halley recorded all of, paul, all of simon and garfunkel's albums all of paul simon albums dylan albums birds Great guy and a serious audiophile. And people say, oh, audiophiles don't care about music. Oh, sure. right, okay, sure. So uh, he said he wanted to get some new, new. <laughs> what would I recommend? And I said, you should, uh, I'll give you Mike Lathis's phone, phone number, call him up, tell him who you are, tell him I said call, and go through your dealer, of course, because, you know, and uh, and try, try his stands. And he says, I'm kind of skeptical about stands, but okay. And he got the whole, I think at the SXR racks, I think he got, I don't remember exactly. And he called me and said, Michael, the difference that made to my system, I, I couldn't believe it. It's yep. the quiet that I hear now, or I don't hear, it's like, I didn't believe that a, a rack could make a difference like that. Well, it's so funny that we buy all this equipment to have fidelity, and then we buy this other stuff to get rid of noise. <laughs> <laughs> but, but it does work that way, guaranteed. Yep. So, Michael Frimmer, uh, editor at, for Analog Planet and Stereophile Senior Contributing Editor, thank you so much for being on today. We appreciate your time. It was a pleasure, Alan. I hope to see you in person one of these days when we're allowed to travel again. Absolutely. Will you hang on just for one second? I'm going to finish up here, and then I just have something I want to do for you off the line. Um, so, anyway, uh, this has been Hi-Fi Chats number 11. Look forward to uh, next week. Uh, we will have Roger Lowe from Sonos here with ARC, uh, which is their new sound bar and a couple other new products in discussion as well. So again, I thank you for joining us. This is Alan Jones with Hi-Fi Buys and Michael Freeman with Hi-Fi Chats. Thanks.